Grant to do a roll call in about one minute and we're getting ready. Started. Hi, does everybody see the screen okay? Yep. Eric, figure out how to see the screen and everybody else at the same time. I'm only getting maybe six. Uh, yeah, you're going to have to stretch it out using the corner there. But um, unless you have like two screens, okay. which I think. Okay. All right, so while Scott's presentation is, is on, um, everyone, you may have to just chime in that you would like to ask a question um, at the end of his presentation because I can only see about six of you right now the way my screen is. So this is just a technical issue, but. Okay. Good morning, Chandra, just saw you pop in. Okay, so I thank you everyone for joining us today. This is our second WebEx um, Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority board meeting. I am going to ask our clerk, Grant Bevel, if he could please do the roll call. Good morning, everybody. I'll do this in alphabetical order, starting with Member Beatty. How are you doing? doing? Member Brady. Member Brady. Member Bilsma. Present. Member Clark. I am here. Member Coon Peterson. Member Coon Peterson. I'm present. Thank you. Member Cridlin. Present. Member Fior. Member Foster. Present. Member Hlinga. Here. Member Hewson. Member Hewson. She's here. I'm here. Thank you. Sorry. Member Ingrail. Here. Member Kaywall. Here. Member McKenzie. Oh my goodness. Pre present Grant. Thank you. Member Metcalf. Present. Member Rapley. <sighs> Member Rapley. Here, did you get it? No. Thank you. I understand Member Shurton may join us later. Member Smith. Yes. And Member Steele is unavailable. Member Woodhouse. And member Wright. Yes, here. Thank you. And of course, we have our chair, Chair Johnson. Thank you, Grant. So, the Niagara Peninsula watershed is located on traditional territory of Indigenous peoples dating back countless generations. We want to show our respect for their contributions and recognize the role of treaty making in what is now Ontario. Before we get started, I just want to remind all those to please mute your phones and mute your uh, microphones, please. Uh, remember that I will be asking for all those who are opposed to the item instead of all those that are in favor. And uh, if you want to speak, please wave or quickly say your name while phoning in. So for the time being, while we have the presentation up on the screen, I would appreciate it if you could just quickly say your name if you want to ask questions or speak. So, um, Grant, as the chair, as the clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? I believe we'd like to add some correspondence that was circulated to members last night uh, from Sullivan Manny, and it relates to report FA15-20, which is item 8B on your agenda. I think you'd like to receive that correspondence in conjunction with the report. Okay, thank you very much. So I am going to have a motion from Stu Beattie, Member Beattie and Member 
Bilsma that uh, we approve the agenda as amended. Anyone opposed? Thank you, it's carried. So now we go to the approval of the amin of the minutes. Both of them are, one is dated uh, April the 16th, 2020. This is the full, special full authority meeting. We also have approval of the minutes of the regular full authority meeting dated April 16th, 2020. It's moved by member Clark and seconded by member Coom Peterson that we approve those minutes. Are there any questions, comments? Any opposed? Sorry, Brenda. Yes, ma'am. Um, I wasn't at that meeting, so I just like to abstain. Okay. And Grant, I think Ed just got Smith that. also. And Ed Smith also. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, so no one is uh, is opposing, so I'm assuming that's approval. Thank you very much. We're now down to correspondence. We have two pieces of correspondence to be received. The first one is correspondence to Premier Doug Ford, dated April 27th, 2020, from the Executive Director of the Ontario Nature and the Executive Director of the Environment Defense and Environmental Defense, and also the Executive Director from the Canadian Environmental Law Association. The second piece of correspondence is from Conservation Ontario, and it's it's concerning the Conservation Ontario's comments on proposed amendments to the Ontario Regulation 244-97 and the Aggregate Resources of Ontario Provincial Standards under the Aggregate Resources Act. It is moved by Member Crinlin, second by Member Fior to receive. Is there anyone who would like to ask questions or anybody, um, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, ask questions or, or comments? Seeing none, any opposed to receiving them? Hearing none, they are received. And I do uh, appreciate that uh, Grant just chimed in. Are there any declarations of interest before we we continue? Thank you. And thanks for the reminder, Grant. I'm sorry, it's not on, it, it wasn't on this particular roadmap, but that doesn't uh, surprise me. I changed it so many times. We have a third piece of correspondence. This came in at a very late date. Normally we don't um, accept correspondences this late in the, in the day, uh, but it does refer to item 8B under the per, and uh, it's specifically FA-15. So can we please receive it and refer it to that report and we will talk about it when we get to that report. So I have it on uh, member Foster, seconded by he member Helenga. Any opposed? Hearing none, it's carried. So now we're on to presentations and I saw Scott earlier, he's up on video. And this is Scott Pluggers from KPMG and this is regarding the audited financial statements and audit find findings report. Please note, Scott can also answer any questions regarding the 9.1 audit and budget committee minutes, specifically number FA-24-20 the 2019 audited financial statement. So if you have any questions for his presentation, as well as the 9.1 um, FA2420, that would be the time to ask him at the end of his presentation. Have we got Scott? Yes, good morning, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, well, there you are. Hi, Scott. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, um, and, and thanks for having me. Certainly, uh, we've done a number of these now, and then they seem to be kind of almost running routine uh, from a virtual presentation, if you will. So, what I'd like to do is I will try and pause for questions as I go through where I, where I think it might make sense, and either please interject, you know, as I progress. Otherwise, uh, you can ask the questions at the end, and then happy to take any questions. I would like to just start with the audit findings report briefly, if I could take you through that. Uh, the, you know, usual practices, we'd walk you through the findings report first from the audit and highlight any key areas uh, from the audit of the financial statements and then just take you through an overview of the financial statements before any questions. So, um, Grant, I don't know if that's okay if we can shift. I don't know which order you have uh, the PDFs. And if you want me to go. This is, uh, this is Erica here. Um, I'm going to be running through the live uh, presentation here and on the documents. So, did you not want this one? Do you want it the other presentation? Yeah, first, if that's okay, just uh, it flows a little bit, a uh, little bit. Right here. 
yeah, this is really the, the meat and, and meat and potatoes, if you will, I guess, of, of what we like to discuss and ensure that we, you know, we complete our, our practice around discussions with the board and charge with governance. So I would like to start here if that's okay. And, uh, and then just walk you through the findings report. Then we'll move back up to the statements. Perfect. And everybody sees this uh, screen okay? Thanks, Erica. Remember, everybody, please mute. Okay, that's great. So if we can just start on page one, Erica, I'm if you're navigating. So just down to page one after the table of contents. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so pages one and two here. Okay, uh, this is our executive summary and really just to highlight, of course, what's to come in the report as well as a bit of an overview. So this was presented to the Audit and Budget Committee uh, and hence the reference to the Audit and Budget Committee there, but very relevant and important for your information as members of the board. Uh, what I will just mention with respect to the uh, executive summary is with respect to COVID-19, of course, being the hot topic, is uh, certainly we had to have a discussion with management and understand any potential impacts largely as it relates to subsequent events. So given the timing of when COVID really you know, impacted the Canadian economy, as opposed to your year end being December, there was really no adjustment or consideration for figures that are reported as at December 31, 2019. So no impact to your financial statements, but certainly some discussions held around future impacts as it relates to your fiscal year 2020. So I will mention that when we get to the notes to the financial statements, uh, but just to make reference that there is no impact to your financials as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And with respect to finalizing the audit, so these are some routine housekeeping matters with respect to finalizing the audit, one of which has now been completed as a result of the discussions with the audit. And budget committee, certainly we do require the receipt of the signed management representation letter, which management does have now. And then ultimately obtaining evidence of the of the statements, which, you know, barring anything that may come from the meeting, uh, we would anticipate that happening today and we're prepared to issue our audit opinion. So really just housekeeping matters at this point with respect to finalizing the audit. On to page two, the executive summary uh, just continues on. But one point here, we like to just make sure we mention each and every year with respect to independence. So we are independent uh, with respect to the services that we do provide the authority. And it is important that we note that to you, there are a number of uh, checks and balances, if you will, within the firm to ensure that should there be any services that are proposed or considered that might impact the authority, uh, they do go to the engagement partner who has the uh, ultimate authority to review that service and ensure that there's no uh, impairment uh, in our independence, whether in fact or appearance. So just important to make, make note of that to you each and every year. Okay. On to page three. So the audit risk, and I might spend a bit more time, hopefully that's okay, because normally we would have an audit planning report, uh, which highlight a lot of this, and we would just highlight our results. So I'll just make sure that I spend a, a moment on, on some of the key risks, uh, and then just so you can get the full understanding of the audit findings report. Uh, page three, though, the two risks, fraud risk from revenue recognition and the fraud risk from management override of controls. These are risks that are required to be addressed in each and every audit sector entity and not-for-profit, a public corporation, it really doesn't matter. These risks have to be addressed. Uh, with respect to fraud risk from revenue recognition, this is the revenue recognition that sits in the financial statements. And we are able to rebut this risk under professional standards, and we have done so for the authority and consistent with other authorities that we uh, audit and are involved in within the province. Uh, certainly, we have to look at professional judgment. We have to look at the nature of the transactions. And that doesn't mean we ignore revenue recognition. We just do not consider it a fraud risk. Still no concerns from a revenue recognition standpoint in your financial statements for December 31, 2019. And with respect to the fraud risk of management override of controls, this risk cannot be rebutted. And really that's just given management's unique nature within the organization and ability to override controls. So we do have to address procedures and design procedures to address that risk, largely consisting of looking at unusual journal entries, relationships and transactions, as well as any significant transactions that might occur during the year that are considered one time, uh, if you will, by definition. So uh, we do look at those, but again, no concerns from either of those risks. So important to highlight to you there. Um, with respect to pages four, five, six, yes, four, five, and six, uh, this is certainly not all encompassing, uh, but, but really some of the key areas that we spend a considerable amount of time with respect to audit, uh, being government grants, levies, any deferred contributions that come in, uh, operating expenditures, including salaries and benefits. 
uh, tangible capital assets as well as you can see there. So overall, these pages really summarize for you our procedures and our approach and no significant findings to report, which, which is certainly a good point uh, to highlight. We do have to look at those in accordance with public sector accounting standards, as well as understand the process that management follows to record the transactions in your financial statements. Uh, and again, overall, no concerns uh, with respect to the items that we, we've tested. So I won't read these in detail, but certainly I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. On to page seven, so materiality. So it is important that we communicate materiality to you each and every year. And again, normally this would come to you at the planning stage uh, and just given a number of things that happened in the beginning of the year, uh, we would look to bring this forward to you for next year and uh, in the planning stage. But materiality for the year ended December 31, 2019 has been set at 260,000, which is very consistent year over year, the prior year being 250,000. We do have a bit of flexibility and judgment in terms of what we can set materiality at using a benchmark of total revenues. We do look at revenues both prior year and year to make sure, of course, we're setting the thresholds appropriately. And we do have a little bit of uh, judgment involved and room to be able to set our materiality percentage, which you can see there is being set at 2.5%. The 260,000 that you see there, that's materiality for the financial statements as a whole. The audit misstatement posting threshold really is the key number for you to take away, if anything, from this slide, which you see there as being 13,000 prior year, 12,500. What that number represents is really anything below that is to us considered trivial or not significant. Anything over and above 13,000, we would say is a potential adjustment that we have to raise to management and, uh, and recommend that they correct. So certainly the 260,000 is, is kind of the top line materiality, right? Where materiality for the financial statements as a whole, but certainly we do not audit to that number. We audit at a much, much lower threshold. So important to, to highlight that to you there. Uh, on to page eight. So actually I, sh I should just make a comment uh, with respect to Lee's and the team, you know, very appreciative of, of how we had to work and navigate this audit as it was really done remotely. So I don't like to use the word virtually in that sense. We were just working in a different location, but uh, certainly very appreciative of, of the work and you know, how we were able to turn that around working together uh, in the environment that we're in. And so this slide here just highlights to you some of the tools that we were able to utilize both for the secure sharing of, of your information to us as auditors, whereas normally we might be on site and you know the traditional USB mechanism. So the use of our client collaboration site as well as data share, which is something that we implemented uh, last year, I believe it was last year, uh, was the first year. And it's a secure mechanism to be able to share your financial transactions with us in a nice, clean, consistent format that basically en enables us to be able to, to hit the ground running, if you will, with the audit. Um, on to the next page, really nothing to, to highlight here other than, so I'm on page nine here, Eric, if that's okay. Um, Great, thank you. Just other than commenting the fact that your statements are prepared, of course, in accordance with public sector accounting standards, no concerns with respect to disclosure of your financial statements. Okay. Uh, pages 10, 11, and 12 highlight for you both the uncorrected and the corrected adjustments. The uncorrected differences on page 11 really just continue to, uh, well, should fall off uh, as of next year. This was as a result of the way that the vacation accrual was previously being tracked, if you will, outside of the financial statements, not material, and management has taken the recommendation from last year's audit and has since now corrected that. But because we have an uncorrected adjustment for the December 31, 2018 year end, that adjustment carries forward for one year uh, into 2019, and that will subsequently fall off for next year. But of course, we're required to highlight it. 12, we highlight the corrected adjustments. I will just make a point that really these do not stem from any control deficiencies, any issues in terms of management's approach. This is really around some more judgmental areas and as well as some of the nuances between how you might account for things in a fund accounting world or a budget world as a public sector accounting for financial statements. So I'd call them routine adjustments, but uh, really just a matter of housekeeping items to ensure appropriate treatment. Uh, in the presentation of the financial statements. Um, as well, the one though that you can see there with respect to the salary continuance, I'm happy to take any questions on it, but given when the salary continuance was approved and finalized in 2019, the standards would, would say to you that uh, once that's approved and in place, you're required to record that as both a liability and an expense and draw that liability down as, as you continue to pay that. So that adjustment was made in your financial statements. Okay, uh, with respect to page 13, the other observations. So, I call these other observations as uh, 
meet the definition of a control deficiency in the, in the traditional sense, but the, there's still an observation. With respect to employee future benefits, this continues to be here year over year, but not a significant impact. It's really just to highlight to you that despite the fact that you have very few employees who might fall under a, a post-employment benefit plan or a future benefit plan, the standards require you to have an actuarial valuation but really when management weighs the cost benefit of it, the fact that this will eventually fall off in the next few years, uh, the decisions made of course not to complete evaluation. Uh, we look at the accounting for it and, and make sure we do a bit of sensitivity analysis around it, but we do have to highlight to you that technically the standards say you need evaluation, but really it's not material to your financial statement. So we are required to highlight that to you either way. With respect to segregation of duties, um, you know, certainly if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them, but I won't read that in detail. We are satisfied with respect to overall the segregation of duties, uh, especially as you know, Lise has come on and, and you know, kudos to John in the past in terms of continuing to get things up to speed and ensuring controls are in place where needed. It's just more of an observation that we noticed during the year, which as we understand management has now since uh, implemented additional controls in place to minimize the risk with respect to segregation of duties. So we will look at that for our 2020 year end audit uh, and report back any findings if there are any. On page 14, uh, some COVID information for you. I'm sure you might be getting inundated both from a, a, an actor and ministry standpoint and as well as just general uh, inboxes that are filling up these days. But uh, a bit more insight for you with respect to COVID, especially one that's actually important, I find, from your perspective is the board's perspective, the one at the bottom there, uh, with respect to governance matters and all things COVID. So the links there are really just for your information to be able to browse, which are continually being updated you know, as legislation seems to be updated almost uh, weekly, at least for a while now. So certainly just a bit more detailed information. And then the next several pages a walk through, so pages 15 and on, walk through uh, some of the upcoming accounting standard changes that will be coming. Um, some discussions within the public sector accounting group and the public sector accounting board on deferring some of the adoption of new standards given the COVID impact. Uh, I mean, I know 2022 sounds a few years off, but it's really only a year and a half before uh, that uh, rears its head, if you will, with respect to asset retirement obligations being the big one. Eric, I don't know if we can just scroll down one page. This will be the final piece of the uh, audit findings presentation. So asset retirement obligations, I would encourage you uh, to read this, the snapshot that we've provided for you on these standards. With respect to asset retirement obligations, we are anticipating this to be quite a bit of work on behalf of management. We're not really uh, anticipating maybe a huge impact or adoption with respect to the conservation authority, but it, it's not yet known without a, a significant amount of work uh, that has to go in behind the scenes. Why we raised this now and we've raised it for the past year or so is that, uh, you know, it would be, uh, I don't want to say wrong, but it would be in, in not wrong, I guess is the word I would use to start this process in 2022's fiscal year because the standard requires you to develop a comprehensive list of your assets and go through and assess whether or not you have any obligation to retire that asset in the future. Do you have to do something in the future to remediate it, to fix it, to dismantle, whatever the case might be. Oftentimes they can be carried in agreements. Uh, there, there is quite a bit of work that's, that's needed to satisfy both us as auditors, the accounting board, uh, as well as your financial statements that that standard has been adopted appropriately. Certainly, we are able to help management uh, without impairing our independence as that process moves along, uh, but just to, to be aware of it, that it, it will be a, a, an exhausting exercise when the time does come. But I did mention that we'll keep management up to date on any potential deferrals on the adoption of that uh, should that happen. Okay. And then the remainder of the next several pages walk through again some of the standard changes that are being proposed or potentially coming that may impact your financial statement in the future, but no, no real information to share at the moment public private partnerships as well as you can read there. Um, and then the last, our appendices are, are just standard communications we're required to communicate. Hopefully hopefully that wasn't uh, too much time consuming, but I wanted to make sure we had a full discussion. So if there's any questions, otherwise we can move to the statements for a brief overview. Thank you, Scott. Are there any questions from anyone? And, and please keep in mind, I cannot see you waving. So if you could just insert your name. Wow, Scott, you were just amazing. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, I, I'll take that. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure, why not? Well, you know, you're still here, so you may get questions at the end anyways. Okay, Scott, you're on. Uh, now we're on to the uh, audited statement. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, so if we could just move to the next page, actually, Erica, and uh, just a quick comment on the audit report. And you will notice, of course, the financial statements stay draft, and that ties in with the audit findings report that one of the final procedures we need is obtaining evidence of the approval of the financial statements. Once the financial statements are approved, the draft watermark that you see there will come off and we're prepared to issue an unqualified audit opinion. So in other words, a clean audit opinion. So I think that's important to note uh, there. So you can see in the, the opinion paragraph there with respect to, as I mentioned, unqualified audit opinion, but uh, I just wanted to make a quick note on the audit report. So if we can slide down a few pages, I think it's three pages. The audit report is quite lengthy, of course. Um, great, thank you. So that's, yeah, that's perfect there. So with respect to the statement of financial position, so as at December 31, 2019, total financial assets, you can see 8.5 million, down from 10.6 million in 2018. And really that was driven by a, de a significant decrease in cash. And I will walk you through that when we get to the statement of cash flows, uh, but that is driving your, your overall decrease in financial assets, but still a, a healthy balance with respect to your financial assets. With respect to financial uh, liabilities, actually a slight decrease year over year down to 3.1 million from 3.3 million in 2018, but there's quite a bit of movement that you can see within the line items that make up your financial liabilities. The increase in your accounts payable and accrued liabilities of about 600,000 largely is attributable to the uh, salary continuance accrual as part of the audit findings report that drove up kind of a, as a one time increase in your accounts payable and that will draw down as the payments continue to be made under the salary continuance agreement. That increase is offset by your regular uh, decrease in your payments on long term debt held with the region. For a total net financial asset position of uh, 5.3 million down from 7.3 million in the prior year, that is still a good indicator for public sector entities. So whether you're a municipality or a authority as yourselves, uh, any entity that follows public sector accounting standards, that net financial asset indicator is a, a metric to pay attention to. So should that continue to dwindle down as a board, that's something that you look at with respect to financial statements. But I would say still in a healthy position from a financial perspective with net financial assets. With respect to non-financial assets, hopefully understandably the biggest piece there being your tangible capital assets. Really uh, some slight uh, increase year over year for additions, largely for a land purchase that happened in 2019 that's offset by amortization that's required to be recorded. The total non-financial assets of 21 million. And finally, a total accumulated surplus for the year ended December 31, 2019 of 26 million. If we can just move on to the statement of operations. So this highlights and summarizes for you uh, your revenues and expenses that were uh, generated in the year. One thing you might notice is the financial statements do look slightly different than other financial statements with respect to expenses. Uh, you do have to look at the segmented note disclosure, which I'll draw your attention to at the end of this uh, with respect to salaries and benefits, interest, amortization, and so on. PSAB requires you to report your expenses uh, effectively by function or by department. So you can see that there. Uh, total revenues year over year, 10 million in 2019 compared with 12.2 million in the prior year. Hopefully that is to be, uh, or not otherwise unexpected, really largely driven through the budget as a result of the decrease in the special levy that you can see year over year. Uh, really no concerns uh, from a, a revenue standpoint, 10.8 million uh, compared with 12 million in the prior year. Really, like I said, driven by that line item with the revenues. With respect to expenses, expenses are both up from budget and both up from prior year. You can see 12 million in 2018 compared with 9.2 million in the prior year. There's really two items that are driving that change from both uh, budget and, and actual. Uh, one of them being the repayment of the levy differential that was approved in fiscal year 2019 of about, I wanna say 2 million, but I'm drawing a blank. Uh, it will come to me, but that is, is, is um, driving a significant increase in your one time, if you will, expense year over year, as well as the salary continuance that was booked in expenses as well. So hence the significant increase there. So an annual deficit for 2019 of 1.1 million, but you know, really attributable to those two kind of significant items in the year. Uh, and again, this is a deficit for accounting purposes. So a deficit of 1.1 million, which had a draw in your accumulated surplus again for an ending accumulated surplus balance of 26 million for 2019. Okay. On to the next. Next page, uh, statement of changes in net financial assets. I, I know I mentioned net financial assets as an important metric. This statement statement for the most part, but it does provide you some information as to how your deficit or surplus reconciles with the change in your net financial 
assets, which is largely your uh, acquisition of tangible capital assets offset by any amortization. Okay. Uh, if we can move to the statement of changes in cash flows. So this statement will take your annual deficit or your surplus and reconcile it to the change in cash. It's important to note this is as at a point in time, so as at December 31st, 2019, and a negative doesn't always mean that there's a loss or a use of cash. Some of it is really just due to timing year over year, but how to take the most away from this statement is really to see, um, or sorry, to read the statement by its subtotals. So the first subtotal there being the net change cash from operations of uh, a draw or a, a decrease in cash of 376,000 year over year. That's just what that tells you is that there was from the day-to-day -day operations of running the authority, you had a draw on cash of 376,000, but again, a, a largely due to the fact that uh, the significant levy differential payment, which was budgeted for and planned for uh, to a large degree is in that number there, which is falling down your cash. So not otherwise unexpected. From there, you had an overall decrease in cash with Finance or sorry, capital activities of 1.6 million for purchases and tangible capital assets, as well as some minor movement in your investments, and then of course your regular repayments uh, from long-term debt of 483,000 for a, a total draw on cash in 2019 of 2.6 million, but still an overall a healthy cash balance at the end of 2019. Maybe I'll I'll pause there if you'd like. Otherwise, I can keep moving. But any questions? Otherwise, I might just need one more minute, and then we can. Uh, questions if that's okay. I'm going to make an executive decision. Let's just go with that one last minute and then we can get all the questions at the end. No problem. Okay. Uh, so note one uh, for the next several pages to walk through the significant account policies. No changes in your policies year over year consistently applied uh, with respect to public sector accounting standards. So just some information for you as it relates to the accounting for the authority. Uh, with respect to note five on page nine, Providing it provides a bit more detail to you to uh, with respect to your tangible capital assets, where uh, the spend was, the significant asset categories, and uh, the classes of assets. Just onto the next, Erica, if that's okay. And the other note I would draw your attention to, if we can just move down to page 14, the segmented information note. This is, as I mentioned, provides its required disclosure under public sector accounting standards. Provides you a bit more insight in terms of the transactions. Um, and, and how they're grouped and what we're used to seeing, right? So things like salaries and benefits, materials, supplies, and so on. And then the last note, just on page 14 of the financial statements uh, with respect to the sub event, uh, that is a standard note that is being placed in each and every one of our financial statements. They do look a little different depending on the impact that COVID has had. And certainly we had some discussions with men around that, but that is just to highlight that the pandemic is there in case anyone's not aware of it. And uh, and the impact really is at this time and, and it will continue to progress throughout 20. Yeah. Okay. That's uh that's it. Hopefully I didn't take up too much time. I sometimes talk a lot, but uh but I'm happy to happy to take any questions. No, thank you very much, Scott. Um I'm going to open up the floor. Who would like to ask questions? Just say your name, please. Oh, you did one. Sorry, I didn't hear either one of those. So no questions? Uh, friend, it's Bruce. I have one if I may. Okay, go ahead. And, and do, uh, I forgot to ask, please, if you have a question about a specific item, refer to that page so everybody can follow the bouncing ball, please. Okay, it goes back to the uh, previous presentation on asset retirement obligations. <laughs> Okay. And the, the, the Scott, uh, this may be a question for staff, but Scott, you mentioned that with the asset retirement obligations coming up for 2020. Don't worry, just the money. It's the money. It's, it's the money. You can get stress. You can get, obviously, when you're stressed, you're not breathing properly. Your lungs kind of build up because you're not expanding. We have somebody else in the line, I guess. Uh, that you noted significant uh, significant staffing uh energies will be required for that and my question is the point would be are do we have adequate staffing and is there a work plan uh, will they need adjustment uh to be able to carry out this task a lot of it has to be breathing and 
Um, before you start, Scott, can everybody please mute? I have a feeling we're listening to somebody's TV set or these radios, so can everybody please mute their microphones? Thank you, Scott. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no problem. I might uh, defer a bit of this to Lise. I just I don't want to comment on the actual level of staffing and whether or not I think it's it's adequate. I just don't know if that's my place to to actually say that. Uh, it will be a bit of work. It, it's a it's a bit of a an exercise that involves the entire. So it's not, it should not just uh, rest on Lise's or Shandra's shoulders. It should be involved anybody from, you know, watershed maintenance operations and so on. Um, so it, it will be a bit of work, but on the staffing piece, it's hard to say. There is a work plan that we have. We offer a number of things to help uh, on the implementation of that standard. So certainly when management's ready to have that discussion, we'd be happy to do, to share that, whether it's, um, whether it's, you know, resources that are available or how we can help along to the implementation process. There are definitely a number of resources that are available for management to be able to start the process, develop a work plan, milestones, and so on, and, and what have you. But on the staffing piece, I might defer that question if that's okay. Thank you, Bruce. That's fine. Thank you, Scott. I'm sure we'll be talking more about this with staff as the future moves in. Brenda, it's Ken. So Thank you, Ken. Go ahead. As the uh, Audit and Budget Committee, uh, this was identified uh, in our review with Scott, and it's on. it will be put on the uh, work plan for the Audit and Budget Committee, so we will not lose track of this as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Any other questions? I'm sorry? Comment as well? Well, of course you can. Thank you. The... Uh, in um, implementing an, uh, a fixed asset and capital planning uh, software module, which will greatly facilitate moving into compliance with this particular standard in another few years. So there is a, a large effort underway currently. And can of all our, all of our fixed assets to position uh, well for implementation of this standard when we uh, move conversation so that when we're ready to um, make sure that what we're the efforts that we're putting in now are in compliance with um, with the standard we can uh, have those conversations likely about this time next year thank you and Lisa and the team thank you very much I heard Scott uh, give lots of kudos to you guys especially under these trying conditions getting this audit done um, virtually i <laughs> know he didn't want to use that word uh, so are there any other comments any other questions for scott and remember this is also referring to fa-15 under 8b i have a question brenda sorry not 8b sorry um mm. 9.1 sorry my apologies so go ahead diana um, thank you. I just have a question about the, I think it was page 203 where it listed the expenses and it had the different categories of um, functions. Is this in um, this presentation or the other one? Uh, it was in this presentation. The I think it's on the actual audited report. Sorry, the audited report. And you said page? I believe it's 203. It just broke the ex the expenses as I believe watershed, yeah, CAO and administration, watershed and corporate resources. And I'm noticing there is quite a fluctuation between what's budgeted and what the actual amounts are. And I'm wondering what the reason for that is. Is it just, yeah. Like as an example, watershed was budgeted at 5.2 million and the actual was 1.8. It's Diana, right? That's yes, Diana. Yeah, yeah, that's actually that's actually a fair question. I'm looking at that and try like from a budgeting perspective, I wonder Lise and I might I might have to double check that. Like I it might have been a, or even similarly, sim sorry, Scott, similarly, corporate resources was budgeted at 2 million and its actual was 7.1 million. So I'm not sure if there was some type of potential like reallocation or, or classification of activities that maybe placed it in a different category. Would that account for that or is there something else going on? And who would like to answer that, Lisa or Scott? Uh, if I may, uh, Madam Chair. 
Okay. Um, what this represents, um, Member Houston, is essentially the corporate real early 2019. And the best example of that is that the uh, restoration program was originally housed and budgeted under the watershed uh, division and was transferred into corporate resources. So you're going to see some of those significant uh, shifts in, and it was a very turbulent year uh, oh. for 2019. So that you'll see some of that is as a result of the um, issues that we resolved in 2019, but the most particular items are, are corporate realignment uh issues and we didn't want to change the approved budget from the uh that was approved by the board right okay that makes complete sense and then i'm just wondering um about the will the well and the opg funding has that have just have those funds now been exhausted or is there still a liability there in terms of the money that we've received and what we've spent if i can uh, through you uh, madam chair what the opg um MOU that was signed in 2019. And I may ask uh, Darren if to maybe confirm uh, my my numbers. I believe the balance at the beginning of the year uh, was 1.242 million that we still had um, to expend of the OPG funds under the terms of the new MOU. And we now meet with the OPG on a quarterly basis and we bring forward projects that we believe uh, fit the um, criteria for um, disbursement of this, of this fund. And in 2019, that amount there represents what we have expended of the $1.2 million um, towards approved projects. So we are continuing to meet with them and the relationship is sound and moving forward uh, quite nicely. Okay, that's great. Thank you for the update. And it looks like you guys have done a lot of work on this in very challenging circumstances. So thank you for the work that you've done here. Absolutely. Are there any other questions for Scott before we receive his presentation? Chair Johnson? Yes, sir. It's Darren McKenzie here. If I could just one yeah. additional thing to uh, Member Houston. Um, uh, Lise is absolutely correct on the, uh, the funding uh, as well. Uh, that agreement goes to 2027. And we are identifying uh, new avenues for how we can best utilize the money within the Welland River watershed as well. Uh, we were supposed to have a meeting in June with OPG, but they have asked that that meeting be pushed back to uh, mid to late July uh, due to the recent uh, events. So, thank you. Thank you, Darren. Diana, you're okay with that? Yeah, I just want to thank you for keeping on top of that because I know it was um, a challenging um, relationship when this new board came on and uh, I'm really happy to, to see the progress that, that our staff have made in, um, in correcting that path forward. Super. Any other questions before we uh, uh, receive the presentation? Okay, hearing none. Uh, so it's moved by Member Hewson and Member Angreo to receive the presentation for Scott with our app thank yous. Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, thank you very much. And Scott, thank you so much for all your hard work. And it's wonderful to hear that we've got a great team at the NPCA helping out here. Absolutely, for sure. And have a good day, sir, and stay safe. Thank you, you too as well. Have a good day, everybody. Great. All right. Thank you. So, folks, uh, Erica, can we remove that now, please, if you don't mind? The presentation. Are you not seeing the PowerPoint now? Uh, I, no, I'd like you to remove the, if we can, uh, remove the PowerPoint just for, or do we going to keep that up all, all through the whole meeting? Yes, it stays up throughout the entire okay. Okay, I just got to figure something out here. Okay, so now we're on to delegations, folks. Uh, we have a written delegation from Save Wayne Fleet, keeping it rule dated May 8, 2020. There is quite a huge document that accompanies this. It's 60 pages. It's on the website now. Um, so what I would like to do is ask Member and Member Smith and seconded by Member Kaywal that we receive this delegation and then direct staff to report a or to provide a report for our June meeting. Any comments or questions about that? Hearing none. Thank you. Any opposed? Hearing none. Thank you. It's carried. 
So now we're on to uh, consent items. All these consent items, 7A, B, C, and D, are going to be received, but we will hear from each of the staff members on this if, if need be. So first we're gonna do 7A. This is report FA132020, and it's concerning the 2020 Provincial Policy Statement Update. Are there any questions and comments? We have Dara McKenzie, if anybody has any uh, comments or questions. Hearing none. So I've got moved by Member McKenzie, seconded by Member Metcalf, that we um, receive the uh, report FA 13 2020. Any opposed? Seeing none, it's carried. Then we have 7B. This is report FA 16 20, and this is the Water Quality Monitoring Program Summary. Steve Miller is available if we have any questions or comments. Are there any questions and comments? I have Member Rapley and Member Woodhouse. Oh, sorry, it's moved by Member Rapley and seconded by uh, Member Woodhouse uh, to receive it. Are there any questions or comments? I have a question. Brenda. And who am I speaking to? Oh, there you go. Hi, uh, Member Woodhouse. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, the um, question I have is in relationship, and they're looking for an amendment here from the, the 30 meter setback. If I'm on the right right report, I think you're on the permit one. Are you not? Uh, I'm on FA 1520. Okay, we're doing FA 1620. This is report 7B. This is the water quality monitoring program. The one I think you're referring to is under discussion items and it's coming up. It's under 8B or 8F, depending on which agenda you got. And that was about the permitting policy housekeeping. So we'll, we'll come back to you when we get to that item. Very good. Thank you. No problem. So we got FA 16-20 and this is the water quality monitoring system. Is there anyone who would like to speak? Diana, you're, oh, sorry. And I keep, I keep forgetting to say member. Member Houston. Speaking. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, in reviewing the water quality report, and I think we've seen this in, in the, even the report card that we saw a, a while back, it seems that the water quality um, ratings are not very favorable. Um, I'm wondering if staff can speak to why we're seeing um, those poor results. Is that a typical result to see? Is there something we Need to be doing or or um, focusing our operations on that can help improve upon that because when I see a report card and it says poor, uh, it tells me that some type of corrective action needs to take place. So if staff could maybe comment on that. Okay. Well, we get Steve Miller up. Um, Diana, is there a page that you want to refer to? Oh, or is that a whole thing? It's uh, sorry, I don't have the page handy, but it's if you look at the map, there's a map where it it gives nodes on the different testing sites and it color codes them in terms of the quality. Okay. Steve Miller, are you on online? Yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you. Um, through you, Madam Chair. Um, the water quality that we see in our watershed is no different than the water quality that we see across Southern Ontario. It's typical for a particularly rural landscape um, uh, the impacts are nutrients and equal. Okay. That is not unexpected um, because folks have been farming and, and living in this watershed for the past 200 years. What we use this information for target severely degraded watersheds and use this information to um, implement restoration programs and use this, uh, our constant water quality monitoring as a baseline to determine if we uh, have been successful. And, and we have seen that there are um, watersheds like Beaver Creek and West Lincoln that have shown an improvement um, over time due to our uh, restoration efforts. But the takeaway is what happens on the land is reflected in the water, urbanization, um, uh, farming practices uh, contribute to the degradation of our water. So, are you saying that our water, that a majority of our watershed is severely degraded? The majority of our water is impaired. 
Diana? Okay. I'm not sure I have further questions. It's just, um, it's kind of alarming to hear that and, you know, may be a cause for concern in terms of how we can, I guess, do better. Um, I don't think that's a reflection on staff at all, but maybe we need to um, uh, refocus some of our resources or, yeah, I'm not sure what the solution is for that, but it just seems uh, concerning to hear that. I just want to follow up on one of the questions, Diana, that you asked earlier, and that was, um, are there any mitigating measures or um, is there anything that's happening to help improve that quality? I think that's what I heard you say at the beginning. So, yeah, Steve, how, can, you, how can we improve our operations if needed to help correct that? There we go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, there are indeed things that can be done, and we are doing them. Um, our restoration program through our efforts to um, reforest lands, uh, construct wetlands, uh, um, other non-government organizations that, uh, that are doing the same thing. Um, yeah, uh, all this goes towards contributing to improving um, water quality. Many of the municipal initiatives, um, rain gardens, um, Stormwater management, improving um, in improvement in those techniques, implementing best management practices, low impact development. All this is going towards um, contributing to improving the quality of water we have on the landscape. But we're we're um, we're making up for 150 years. Things have happened without uh, regard for the impact to the quality of water. So we have program it's almost like a, a doctor you go in and there's the checkup doc how am i doing what's my blood pressure unfortunately we're showing that um the water quality isn't great are we doing things about it absolutely restoration program um other uh, other groups but it's a uh, it takes time it's a process mm -hmm. And I think what I've heard you say is there are some public initiatives that are um, paid attention to this, but in, a, in acknowledging that we have a, a significant rural community and things like farming pra practices can have an impact, is there some type of public education component we could be um, including? Absolutely. Through you, Madam Chair. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, the, the Conservation Authority, we are looking at how to uh, expand our restoration program, how to make more folks aware of it. And part of that restoration program isn't just um, planting trees, constructing wetlands. There's a whole education component around that. And it's not just the Conservation Authority. There's um, uh, stewardship committees, Haldeman Stewardship Committee. Um, I would suggest that uh, Jeff Fricade, who heads up uh, that whole restoration program, would be uh, a better person to uh, speak to these initiatives than myself. Member Houston. Okay, that sounds fine. Thank you. Okay. Well, when we get back to the new normal, hopefully we can get a more fulsome discussion on this. Uh, Brenda? I'm sorry. Brenda, it's Bruce. Thank you. Can everybody else mute, please? Because I'm hearing a lot of chatter. Go ahead, Bruce. Yes, I'd like to first of all thank Member Houston for uh, starting this discussion. Uh, the water monitoring in our watershed is one of the most important obligations that the uh, and this conservation authority has. And as uh, Steve has said, our our watershed is uh, is degraded. And I have a couple of questions. And one is uh, related to budget. Um, and uh, the Steve, I. Is there a need for more sub watershed studies and monitoring stations? Through you, Chair. Steve? All right. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, right now, the funding we have is adequate for the scope of this program 80 surface water monitoring stations, 15 groundwater monitoring stations, and that, that gives us a good um, feel for what's happening in the watershed. Now, if there's a desire to target a, uh, a watershed or a sub-watershed more specifically, more intensely, 
then we would need to um, look at uh, the resources that we allocate for that. But right now, to get a general sense of what's happening in the watershed, um, we the funding, uh, the resources are adequate, currently adequate. All right, well then, thank you. My uh, uh, concerns is with, uh, also lies with sub-watershed studies and identifying where the uh, problems are uh, surfacing and the uh, funding for the stewardship program. And I think as, the, as we move into the future and the chair, as you mentioned, back to normal times, uh, we will continually have to address funding to solve some of our water quality problems. It's what we drink and it's what we need to survive in our industries and agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Member McKenzie. Any other questions and comments before we receive? Yeah, right right inside. Go ahead, Mr. S uh, Member Smith. Yeah, uh, thank you. I I'm wondering at the water quality. So we know our water quality is is not good, um, and we're the responsible agency. At, let's say that it gets worse. What does that look like? Like, do, do we get a warning, and then do we have to make decisions? Or is there something happening in, in the background? Uh, how do we prevent a Walker tin type of situation? I uh, don't feel I know what would happen if the water quality were to get worse to the point that it would be alarming and that the may have to take some kind of crisis action. Is Thank you, please. Or something like that? Process, Mr. Miller? Through you, Madam Chair. There's a couple of things Member Smith touched on. The first is drinking water. Um, we address that through the Source Water Protection Program. Okay, so the Conservation Authority, um, all in partnership with the region, um, implements policies, risk management plans to ensure our water supply, feeding our drinking water plants, uh, is not. That, that that's one segment. The other that we look at with the water quality monitoring program is what is the condition, what is the state of the surface water in our in our creeks, our rivers. We actually note what is happening and we see it's degraded. That is the responsibility. Who is responsible for correcting that situation? Well, all of us. The conservation authority does its part through its restoration program. The municipalities do their part through um, responsible stormwater management practices. The rural community has um, resources through the uh, Ministry of Ag and Food to um, draw on various programs, various educational components. So a lot of folks are doing a lot of different things to help improve the quality of water for many different programs. Is it authority's sole responsibility to reverse this trend? No, but it is our responsibility to monitor and report on the progress we are making. Member Smith. That answers my question. Thank you. Any other questions before we receive the presentation, please? Uh, <coughs> say one more thing. No, hang on a second, please. Randall? Only because you're second time speaker. Who's? I'm sorry. You're gonna have to. Is it? Member Rapley? Yeah. Certainly. Can everybody else mute, please? Uh, testing one, two. Okay. So we've got Stu. Is it Stu that, or is it Member Rapley? Rapley. Thank you. So Member Rapley, everybody else mute. Okay. I just. Um, you know, want to raise the concern for future monitoring in bad positions that the NPCA will be placed in. And right now, I think it should be um, out there very clearly that there are still lots of problems despite the great efforts that NPCA staff and what we do with restoration and try to keep ahead of it. But the rhetoric from the Ontario government is very clearly 
that they're going to relax environmental controls and they're going to in, in relax environmental um, enforcement uh, of pollution. And, and to me, this is a, a tremendously scary situation down the road. And secondly, if you go to municipalities um, for the water quality, what happens in between the municipalities uh, where you may have a company causing a, 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 a lot of pollution and later on, uh, you know, it could be <laughs> so I just wanted to say that perhaps um, this information that it, you know, despite the efforts that everything is not as great as uh, what it could be and that we have to be careful in the future. I can't imagine why anybody would want to do more pollution and not control what we have. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to um, Chandra because there was a comment made about the new regulations are going to be eased up. So maybe you might want to comment on that and, and everybody else, please mute. Thank you. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, and thank you for the question, Member Ravley. I, I understand your concerns. Um, of course, um, right now, cannot speak to any specific regulation that you're mentioning. I need to look at which regulation you're men mentioning. But I can say something, uh, NPCA for sure, there's two things we're talking about. We're talking about our responsibility as a, as a conservation authority to do the science and put the best information out there for our stakeholders and partners to use the science and make the right decisions. And that's what's happening through the report that you've seen. Can we do a better job at, uh, you know, raising alarm or trends and all of that? Yes, we can, and we can do that through our report cards. So, as you know, we do publish report cards on each of our watersheds, and this is a program as part of Conservation Ontario. And in those report cards, we show the trends, we uh, speak to the actions, we uh, mention where action is desired and who can take that action and what NPCA has done. Uh, going forward, right now, you know, the format of those report cards are pretty high level. What we can always do is um, have additional public information uh, for public consumption go out with that. And certainly as part of publishing the report card, that could be considered at the time when we do publish the report card. I understand the concern and it's an important responsibility for us as an organization to share that information and share the science for our best actions. Not only that, through our restoration program, uh, we can certainly uh, take up collective actions uh, with various stakeholders in the watershed. And as you probably know, we have been also doing some fee-for-service work to monitor water quality for the airport and, and, and other stakeholders. And uh, with that science, collectively, I think it tells the trends, it tells where we need to do. And going back to member um, uh, Mackenzie's question on, uh, you know, uh, what sub should planning and identifying trends and sources uh, for both point and non-point, uh, you know, problems of, of water quality. That's all uh, further needs to be done. Uh, further resources need to be invested. As you know, we've just established the watershed program uh, in 2019 and going forward, the direction to staff will be um, to, to look at some watershed planning and how we need to ramp up that program how we need to ramp up our stewardship effort to undertake more action and educate more public, and how we need to ramp up uh, communicating that information to various modes, including our report cards. I hope that helps. Thank you. All right, that's good. Thank you. And I had uh, Member Beatty, and then for the second time, Member Hewson. So Member Beatty. Okay, we got a question. Okay, everybody else mute, please. Maybe Steve would like to comment because this report card. Hello? Uh, this report card hasn't changed drastically in the last 
five, six, ten, twelve years. Uh, I remember the PFOS incident in Hamilton. Hang on a second, Member Beatty. Um, Jeffrey, is there any sort of solution for this? Um, it could be, uh, it, well, it's Echo. So if he's got his, um, his volume up on his computer and it's competing with his microphone, if he could fill around with his audio controls there, or if he's got a, a, a phone. Yeah, just knock mine down. Is that better? Oh, 10 times better. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Is that better? Hello. Okay. Can you can you turn your volume down on your computer? Maybe Steve can uh, comment because I remember the PFOS incident at uh, Lake Neopinko in Hamilton, and we raised or it was the, the turtles that raised the concern, and we got into the problem. But uh, as soon as the Ministry of the Environment took over, the NPCA was shut out. Uh, as soon as you identify a problem, the NPCA uh, has to kick it up to the Minister of the Environment, and I think the City of has more authority uh, to do something. The same thing with, uh, we had an incident of uh, oil barrels on the side of a creek, and the NPCA couldn't go on the property. It took the City of Hamilton to go in and clean it up. So if you're looking to, uh, to get a better report card, the restoration program is the only one open to you uh, because everything else, you don't have any authority. The NPCA is a lame duck when it comes to authority. And maybe uh, Steve can correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank you. So Steve, do you want to just chime in before we go to second uh, speaker, Member Houston, please? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Through you, Madam Chair. In Ontario, the responsibility for responding to spills rests solely with the Ministry of the Conservation and Parks. They are responsible to respond and to um, make the cleanup. The NPCA, our water quality monitoring program, is there to monitor the um, condition of the water in the watershed, not to respond to spills. Okay, thank you very much for that clarity. So, Member Beatty. Friend, it's Mel. Can I uh, tune in whenever? Yeah. I'm back uh, again. Okay, Member Beatty, you heard the, the response. I just wanted to make the point that if you're looking for the NPCA to have any kind of authority to change uh, the water quality in the watershed, we have very little. We have very few tools and we have very little authority to do anything really significant. That's been my experience. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'm gonna to go to Member Woodhouse as a first time speaker and then go to Member Houston and then we can uh, receive the presentation. Member Woodhouse. Thank you. Uh, my question to uh, Mr. Miller is, in relationship to this this review and I, and I echo, uh, Diana's uh, view of that map, it was a bit startling to me as well, in that it's the first time I've seen something like that. Uh, is, and I think uh, other members have indicated the, the team effort that it would take to actually enhance or make those red dots go to, to fair or good or whatever. Um, is, there, is there an effort afoot to involve the municipalities and particular the councils of the municipalities that uh, that would see something like this as a part of a uh, information uh, effort, rather than maybe it's just been going through staff and there's a there's this you know a brief summary that's actually been going to the councils. I'm not sure. I've been on a, on a municipal council in a while, so um, I think that if they're aware of what we've just seen here, I think that uh, that'll raise the profile and the uh, raise a lot of questions in relationship to you know what can be done to enhance or reduce uh, those uh, red, uh, red dots as you show them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I think Chandra did mention that. Um, so we have uh, Member Houston for the second time, please. Um, yeah, and this just goes back, I guess, to um, 
response. Uh, when we publish the report card, what exactly does that mean? I'm, I'm assuming, is there more than just posting it on the website? Do we distribute it to different stakeholders, such as our municipalities or different interest groups? How are we communicating those results? Thank you, Chandra. Um, so I, I will have to rely on Jeff, uh, Jeffrey for how in the past we have distributed the report. But what I can tell you from my experience from uh, another CA and CAs across Ontario, it really depends on the community. And I think we, you can use various modes of uh, education and communicating that information. You can do a media campaign. You, if you've done a media campaign or a public campaign in the past, you can go to municipal councils to do water quality presentations and share that information with various municipal councils. So um, I think going forward, uh, that those are all good suggestions and I totally intend to look at our outreach program coming out of uh, our report cards and education program. But I, I think at this point, I do want Jeff to chime in because he's been with NPC for a long time. He's been uh, uh, given the portfolio of watershed planning. Jeff, you want to weigh in on this? Jeff says no. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no, I mean, for sure. Actually, I'm, I'm really excited about this. I see a bunch of light bulbs going off. Um, so my head's swimming with how to answer all. Bear with me for a moment. Uh, I think a lot of what um, Steve has said is, is true, and we're, we're conscious of the fact that with the restoration program, we hold a, a key tool um, to further uh, Chandra's points. What we've got big uh, plans for it beyond the existing program. So the way it is currently set up, we know we can add uh, additional things to complement. But we are very active right now in making sure that our eligibility criteria for the grant program. Some of the that you're seeing from water quality report here. So we are we are orienting and steering our selection criteria to the areas of greatest need. This is also something that the Auditor General identified. So it's lining up with that as well too. But beyond the water quality and, and tying into the watershed report card, which talks about wetland coverage and, and wooded area coverage, um, the degradation in Niagara isn't nothing new. We've known this as staff and scientists for a long time. It's again why I'm saying I'm I'm excited you guys are catching on to this. Uh, and there's more that you can measure to demonstrate this. And we, we've done some of that in the past and we've looked at the cumulative effect and impacts of some of these metrics. And we've actually quantified across the landscape that relative to scientific minimums, and these are minimums. This is what science says you need a minimum on the landscape to begin to consider yourself healthy and sustainable. We, we achieve very poorly. We're, we're about 50% towards what the targets are. So these things that we measure as well are getting integrated in planning. Uh, we can start to hit these areas where we know we're going to get ecological bang for our buck. That science is also for those of you who will be in the uh, land acquisition strategy this afternoon. It'll start to frame some of the, the pretext and context for our efforts there too. Because restoration, land acquisition in terms of security are tools that complement your, um, your policies out there. Uh, for protecting what is existing. And all of those things need to complement to work together so that we have a better landscape. And um, people were mentioning before about the authority. That is in fact true. But what uh, the big thing here is if we keep pushing the science and we keep measuring and we keep understanding where we are, we're gonna have a better chance at impacting uh, the policies that are out there by uh, providing an alternative narrative to the fact that some of the provincial policies aren't cutting it. And that's why we're con continuing to see poor water quality. Um, and then maybe some of those things where there is authority at different agencies and, and, and what we have can begin to change and start to see water quality and some of these metrics change as well. So it's a bigger problem and there's a lot of moving pieces. We're very aware of it internally. We're starting to work multidisciplinary with multi -subject, multiple uh, subject matter experts at the table to comprehend the issues and all the little levers in terms of management tools that we have at our disposal or those that we can influence by commenting. So I hope that was clear. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. 
No, thank you. And I think we still have uh, member Woodhouse. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, I, you know, I, I asked my question and uh, my, my concern was whether other political elements within our communities have a good understanding of the, uh, you know, the warning signs that we see in this thing. And are there, are there efforts to uh, inform them of this so that uh, they can start asking the appropriate questions like we're asking now? Yeah. Can I, can I just finalize my comment? Actually, I'm coming to you just, uh, oh, it was your question, was it yeah. not? It I apologize. I've got a list here okay. and I didn't, and I didn't cross out Malcolm's name. Go ahead. Yeah, Sorry, we'll uh, member. We'll figure it out as we go along. Um, you know, I'm really happy to hear that there's potentially some um, exciting developments coming for restoration or ideas in terms of, of it. Um, I think it's, it's not, I think we need to do a better job sounding the alarm um, and recognizing that, you know, this isn't an NPCA problem. This is a societal problem and we need par our community partners to help us overcome this. And this report card is a very easy way to measure um, the progress that's being made. And it's a great way to publicly demonstrate the value of this organization in making an impact on Niagara and Hamilton's and Haldeman's environmental landscape. So, you know, I think uh, we should pursue looking into a, a greater effort on a public, some type of public engagement piece that that includes our our, our public sector partners as well as uh, private organizations because I, I think it can also help not only improve our environmental landscape but it, it can also help show how important the NPCA is um, um, to our communities. Okay. So, Member Houston, are you comfortable that um, we'll leave it with you to work with Jandra on maybe working out some sort of a, a PR plan, um, that sort of thing? Chandra, are you shaking your head? Yes, that sounds like a plan. So, it, it sounds like, Member Houston, you're on to something really good. And I'm seeing all the, the, the light bulbs go up with the, with the staff. So, are you willing to do that with Chandra? And I see I, Member Halenga wants to. to jump in in a minute. Okay. Mr. Clark also has a question. Member Clark. Thank you very much. And I also have Member Halenga. So Member Clark, and then we'll go to Member Halenga. Thank you, Madam Chair. So can, can I just clarify? I'm trying to understand the protocol that exists. The NPCA does the testing of the water. Who do they inform? Do they and we'll go to let the Jeff. MOE know? Do the, we receive the information clearly inform the board, but beyond that, what's the protocol? Where does the information go? You want that one, Steve, or I, I can I can answer that one. Um, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks for the, thanks for the question. We typically, after we make the presentation to the board, we circulate our member, lower tier municipalities, the city of Hamilton, um, the region of Niagara. County of Haldeman and the local uh, uh, MECP office, um, all of those uh, entities are made aware of the results of the summary report for the previous year. And the MOE? Yes. And how often do we do testing of the water? Uh, continuously. So if we were to find, for example, toxic algae or unusually high E. coli levels, do we alert the MOE, the municipalities, go right to the public? There are health risks. How, how do we deal with that issue? Yep. And through you, Madam Chair, absolutely. If through our routine testing, we come across something unusual, we immediately notify the MOE and the local municipality. And this, um, for instance, in Niagara-on-the-Lake, and there was, uh, uh, through two, a couple of um, uh, big spikes in E. coli were identified. So right away, we informed the MOE and the municipality and provided assistance in tracking down the source of that E. coli. 
So that's that's um, just one example of um, the conservation authority being the the boots on the ground identifying any uh, uh, any potential problems that come up and immediately informing um, the uh, the impacted agencies. Is there a um, legislated obligation to notify the public? That would be a question um, for either the MOE or the local. We notify them, but it's up to them to notify the public. It would depend what the uh, depends what the problem is the scope, niche, and location um, of the problem. Okay, so hypothetically, a very heavy E. coli count in an area where it is or could be used for recreational purposes, whether or not it's canoeing, kayaking, or actual swimming or fishing. Would we notify the general public or would we just simply notify the city and the AMOE? And so if it was an area that um, folks could swim at beach, we would immediately notify the operator of the uh, of that beach and public health. So can I ask, Madam Chair, um, perhaps you and Chandra could meet with staff and 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 review our public notification protocols. I'm just concerned as as you know we've had situations yep. in Hamilton recently and and I've been paying attention to effluence across the province through a couple of NGOs that I've been working with. The lack of public notification from municipalities and the Ministry of the Environment is quite striking. Yep. And so Although we may not be legislated or obligated to notify the public, I suggest that we might have a moral obligation to notify the public. And so if we could have a review in terms of, for example, if you find toxic algae, if you find really high E. coli or cholera counts, um, and it doesn't have to be in a beach, it could be in a stream where people are known to recreate should we set in place policies at the npca where we will notify the public as well as our partners because if we're simply notifying our partners and relying on them to make that decision then we may find ourselves in a situation down the road where we will be judged for not notifying the public although the protocol was that others would be doing it instead of us. So is that a fair request to have you folks look at that and come back with a policy? What would be the threshold where we would unilaterally notify the public as well as our partners? Okay, I'm gonna come back to you um, after we hear from member Halenga and uh, we, it will be to receive a seven point B with the direction to staff for two items. One that uh, uh, the staff will look at um, some public relations work on on the report card, and the other one being uh, you your motion on on public notification in in the event that uh, uh, that there's some risk to the public. So if you want to wordsmith that a little bit, and then I'll come back to you after Helenga. Is that okay? Thank you, Chair Johnson. Thank you, and Member Helenga. You need to unmute yourself, sir. trying to find the button thank you, you uh, Chair Jensen. <laughs> and uh, my comment and questions were almost asked uh, completely by uh, member Houston and member Clark regarding who are we notifying are we issuing this report card to all the municipalities and uh, the ministries uh, suggesting that MNRF also be included. And then some of the community groups, one that comes to mind is the Niagara Coastal Community, uh, Lake Erie Coastal Community, and um, they are also uh, involved in effluence from creeks and uh, water courses into the Lake Erie North Shore. So um, 
thank you to the other members that brought up the same thing. Okay, super. So if we can include, um, yeah, so if we can get the staff to come back with a, pub, or the, a report on the public notification and that would include uh, all stakeholders. So I'm going to come back to member Clark. Um, oh, sorry. Hello. Oh, sorry. Member Beatty. May I make two suggestions? Firstly, if staff would go back into the records and provide the board with the copy of the first report card and maybe uh, a couple of years later, and then they can compare the early report cards to this report card. That might be worthwhile for the board knowledge. The other uh, suggestion that I would uh, make is that could we contact the Hamilton CA and find out what they do with the quality report card? Thank you. Okay. And Chandra, do you want to chime in there? Just on uh, a couple of things, just on report cards first. I think that's a good idea. I was going to say that we do need to look at long term trends. The short term trends, when you're talking water quality, are probably not important. They are probably caused by something and they need to be reported. But in terms of water quality across the watershed, you've got to look at long term trends. And yes, internally, we can compare the first report card ever published to now. However, I caution because the parameters you have used to monitor while you, you have to compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges. So we need to look at what parameters were used to develop those report cards um, and, and, and what parameters we use now for our program. So that's the first question. I do think we need to bring back a report to the board on uh, the what if of this water quality report. You know, so what does this mean for our watersheds? Uh, and compare some of that data. Now, in terms of the report card, I can tell you uh, not only just Hamilton, every conservation authority across the province uses the same format that Conservation Ontario has set a few years back. I think it was five or 10 years ago, five years ago, Conservation Ontario came up with the format for every conservation authority because everybody was reporting differently. And okay. it's a very high level format. However, CAs are allowed to add a few indicators depending on their watershed. So for instance, if you are in a very urban watershed, you could add an indicator on stormwater and stormwater quality. And so there is some flexibility there. What I think we should do is um, take a look at what are public education, first, the what if trends, what's happening in our watershed, and then how do we ramp up our stewardship or education program to educate people about that? Secondly, going back to um, member um, uh, Clark's uh, question, I would like to suggest, and I do need to talk to Darren and Steve about that, is first we look at our obligations and 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 who's doing what and then i think uh, based on that information we should consider whether we need a policy of our own or we can use the existing tools uh to be applied to what he's asking for so i i, I would like to break it down into several pieces i think there's a lot of things we are talking here right okay so um I know that we went to, um, mem I was going to go to Member Clark anyway, so I'm going to ask Member Clark for uh, a comment on that and see whether or not we can adjust the uh, staff direction accordingly. Thank member you. Member Clark. Thank you, Chair Johnson. So um, to answer Member Beattie's question with regards to what does the Hamilton Conservation Authority, uh, what's their policy, uh, Chandra is correct. It's the same as all the other CAs across the province. They notify the municipality, they notify the province, and it's an annual report. The challenge with that process is that if things happen during the year, they don't report it. For example, in Hamilton, where we had an open gate 
by 5%, and it was open for, I think it was two and a half years. Um, the HCA and the province of Ontario had testings of the water showing higher than normal E. coli, and that the numbers were way off the chart. They simply followed the protocol that is already established and we're filing them with their annual reports to the ministry. So there was no public notification. There was no notification to public health. You've got a problem here. We've just got a hot, we just tested this particular waterway and you have a hot load. So um, we've recognized it as an issue and we're going to be trying to address that in Hamilton but when I'm looking at what we're doing here, and it's great having these annual reports and it shows trends over the long term, and we get aggregate information in terms of the health of, of all of our waterways, uh, which is fantastic, which is a part of our role. But if we're testing, and in July, for example, we test and we see uh, excessive algae blooms and they happen to be of the toxic variety, I would hope that we wouldn't simply file that in our annual report and not notify the local municipality, the, 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 the province and the public, because I would think that we have an obligation to notify the public. Likewise, if E. coli counts are really heavy and they could be an urban waterway, it may not necessarily be in a beach, it could be an urban waterway um, from storm runoff that yes, the, the, the counts are really high right now, but we notify the public so that they know don't don't canoe in that waterway or don't send your kids out to collect tadpoles in that waterway until that E. coli clears out. So those are the concerns that I have. And what I would suggest, uh, Chair Johnson, is the motion would be to direct staff to review the public notification of public health risks, the protocols, policies, and obligations for water testing, and that we um, consider drafting a policy that would set um, the thresholds when we would when we would be notifying public health as an urgent notification and the public as an urgent notification. Does that make sense? I it makes perfect sense to me only because I have just as much history in this as you do. So Chandra, do you understand the uh, direction and and does that make sense? Because I think we're both saying the same thing. You wanted to take a look at our policies. Councilor or uh, Member Clark is asking. For that look at the policies and see where we can enhance it if need be i i agree that's fine uh, the motion as it stands is fine it's in two phases member clark has already uh kind of put it under under two sub motions basically i think the first step in this process will be for us to look at all the protocols and reporting protocols uh and our our relationship with public health uh entities across the watershed um and how how do we report on that and the second piece will then, I think we would like to bring back a report uh, before we delve into maybe thinking of a policy, but certainly that's at the table and, and we will take that. Phase. Well, can I suggest, uh, Chair Johnson, that perhaps we might want to check our legal liability if we're aware that there's a high E. coli account or uh, a high algae account that is toxic and we don't notify the public and something, a tragedy occurs, what would our liability be? Because yeah, I think if we, if we get the answer to that question, that question should automatically lead us to the proper protocol to notify the public. Absolutely. Okay. So I think, I think that uh, Chandra got the direction correctly, um, Member Clark. Chandra yes. got the correction. I see you're shaking your head. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. So it has been moved by Member Clark and I'm going to put Member Halenga as the seconder, if you don't mind, Member Halenga. Um, and uh, Member Clark, please read out your motion one last time and then we'll have a vote. Uh, the first part of the motion, so part A, is to direct staff to review the public notification of public health risks and the protocols, policies, and obligations for the NPCA. And the second part would be for staff to review the legal liabilities on the NPCA should a tragedy occur in a waterway um, 
as a result of um, contamination that we did not notify the public and then have staff review those policies and recommend uh, direction for the board. Okay. Any discussion, comments, anyone? Uh, Brenda, it's Rob here. Okay, Rob. Member Foster? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, uh, it's Member Foster here. So um, I was wondering um, uh, with this particular motion as it's going through, um, um, and and my understanding is that we we live within the realms of what the province is doing. Like, like is there some thinking process, uh, for Member Clark, et cetera, that, that we want to Okay, I think I'm going to have to ask you to do that again. Oh, I got I got the question. Did you? Okay, it just it bounced in and out for me. So go ahead. Yeah, I think I think uh, Member Forrest's question was specifically to um, what the provincial policies and mandate is to to the conservation authority, and and in essence, are we going further than our mandate would allow us to. Right. And I and, okay, thank you. and I don't I don't the the challenge is that the mandate is very specific in terms of what we're doing and we're notifying the province here's our annual water quality reports and we're notifying the member municipalities here's our, our annual water quality reports. But that mandate is not a defense for us against liability if we knew about, for example, a toxic algae outbreak and we didn't notify the public, if we didn't act with due diligence. So what I'm saying is that policy that exists and that mandate would not be a defense for us in court if we get sued because someone, some child was exposed to toxic algae and died. And so we want to make sure that we understand our liability and then make sure that we have policies in place should this happen. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not saying that it has happened, but should it happen that there's some form of contamination in one of the waterways that we become aware of, that we have a protocol in place, our staff knows what exactly to do in that situation. Okay, Member Foster. Yeah, that's fine, uh, uh, Chair Johnson. I, I, uh, I just wonder um, with these types of things, how far we take this. Like, um, um, as I do know, you know, like, well, it, let's use the example you guys have from Hamilton. I mean, um, the reality is, is that you know there was a pretty interesting situation going on with with waste management, and um, but the question coming back, okay. What do we have to be reporting? And I, so it's, it's okay. Actually, I like this motion. I like where we're going. Um, um, and it'll be interesting when we get the answers back. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments and questions on the on the actual motion? Yes. yes. Okay. You know what, Stu? You're going to have to turn down your volume on your computer. I think. Not a problem. There it is. I got to turn it up to hear you guys, and I got to turn it down to talk to you guys. Okay. <laughs> good? Yeah, we're good. Thank you. Maybe Mr. Clark or uh, Chairman Johnson can comment on what were the liabilities uh, outlined by the City of Hamilton's legal department uh, for the stuck gate going into Coots Paradise. Um, actually, that was an in-camera. Um, I'm I'm a little bit hesitant to. You're gonna have to be a little more specific because there's a lot of that was in camera. It was client solicitor privilege, so you might have to be a little more specific about your question, please. Well, we're talking about legalities and responsibilities of legalities. So Hamilton has just had a very serious situation, a very serious incident. Your legal department, if you can't comment, if it was in camera, then that ends the discussion. But uh, it would be interesting to find out uh, what Hamilton's legal department uh, opinion was on the responsibilities and the liabilities of the city of Hamilton and the stuck gate. Thank you. Chair Johnson, if I may. Yes, you may. 
So I can't speak to anything that would be solicitor privileged, uh, solicitor client privileged um, communications, but I can state that the liabilities remain untested in a court of law. So the policies that currently exist, everyone did what they were supposed to do. They notify the province, they notify um, uh, the Conservation Authority, notify the province, no one, no, nobody notified the public. And so that's wherein there's a, a glitch in the system. So if we look at these things on a holistic matter, an annual report was received, here's the numbers, uh, and now we're aware of a problem, but we weren't aware of the problem when it was actually happening. And it was frustrating for me personally to find out that the Ministry of the Environment had the information, but equally didn't raise the alarm bell with the city of Hamilton. So all I'm saying is, Sandra, talk to our legal uh, um, eagles <laughs> to see what our liabilities are, and should we have some type of policy that if we find ourselves in this situation, we not only notify the MOE and the municipalities, but we unilaterally notify the public, and that's the question. Thank you. And let's go back to the motion now, please, folks, because we want to move the meeting along. We've got a pretty heavy agenda going here. So are there any other uh, comments or questions? Seeing none, can who is up? Oh. Wait a minute. Hello. I'm sorry, I can't see you. So you're going to have to see your name. Yeah, it's Mel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. My question, I, I, agree with, I agree with the direction they, that we're taking here in terms of the legalese. But at the end of the day, I mean, let's be honest, if there's a situation that's evolving public safety, uh, not only do we as an organization have an obligation to uh, make that make the public aware of it, we also have that as individuals as well. I mean, this is the public safety is paramount to any other thing. I would rather us be named in a lawsuit or uh, being the one that uh, uh, advised the public as soon as possible than the one that didn't do anything. Thank you. Correct. Correct. Thank you. So, any opposed to this motion? Seeing none, it's carried. And now it's, uh, it was moved by a member Rapley and member Woodhouse to receive the report as amended. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Any opposed? Seeing none, thank you. It's carried. Now we're on to report FA 22 2020. This is the Auditor General update report. If there are no questions, um, it's moved by Member Wright, seconded by Member Beatty to receive it. Any questions? Chandra is here to happy to um, answer. Can I get on okay, I heard three people. Go ahead. One person, uh, just say your name, please. Okay, I got Ken. Who was the other one? Member Hewson, can you put me on the list, yeah. please? Yeah, thank you. There's some way I wish I could get rid of this presentation so I can see everybody. Okay, go ahead, uh, Member Kaywell. Uh, thank you. So just a point of clarification, at the uh, December 18th board meeting, uh, the board approved the motion to forward the um, what was called the AG response recommendations to the AG and to the Minister of uh, MOECP as the uh, midpoint update. Uh, the briefing note uh, doesn't make any mention of that. Uh, and so, and then it was, and the briefing note says shortly thereafter, the AG asked for a midpoint update. So my question is, did we actually send that report to the uh, AG and was it not satisfactory as a midpoint report? Okay, Chandra. I can address that. Thank you, um, Member Kewal. Uh, there's two things we're talking about. As our due diligence, uh, we've been uh, sending our own reports to the AG. So this is, you know, our way of saying, okay, we're on track, we're doing this, just for, so you know. AG has their own process set up. They need more details. They have, uh, you know, they have sent us a more elaborate template, which you, you've just seen. So that she is following. She had called me in February and she did tell me, thank me. We did send a report. 
thanked, thanked us for that. And, and she said, this is the process I follow. I'll be asking for that information. So they're following their own process. Okay. Okay, thank you. And we got member Houston, please. Yeah, I just want to um, zero in on one detail that I noticed, which was on page 108 and it makes reference to a corporate culture plan so i'm just wondering is is that in the works will the board be able to see that when something has been finalized so to you yeah thank you um I will try and answer that and Misty can weigh in if needed. Uh, yes, uh, there was a workshop when I was coming in in January. We had a consultant on board um, and a plan is in the place. There is an internal corporate cultural committee that meets uh, to discuss that. It's being finalized as I speak. Misty, would you like to add anything to what I've just said? Misty? Hi, through you. Uh, I think you captured it, uh, to Chandra. We have a, a corporate culture subcommittee uh, that is generating information and ideas to put into a plan. Uh, and then uh, we want to review that with the entire corporation. And once we put a, a plan in place, uh, we'll have something a little bit more formal to, to continue to work towards the culture that we've envisioned. And I, I imagine that will fall in with the strategic plan as well. Thank you. Mary Houston. That's great. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments and questions? Hearing none. So it's moved by Member Bright, seconded by Member Beatty, that we receive this uh, this report. Any any opposed? Hearing none. It's carried. We're on to 7D. This is Report FA 2720. This is the 2019 annual report. Uh, and there was some additional documentation that was circulated to the members. And I'm going to go with Renee. She's going to uh, give us any questions or answer any questions. It's moved by member Bilsma and seconded by member Clark to receive it. Any questions or comments? For you, Chair, I actually had um, a preamble I would like to say to the board members with your permission. Of course. Uh, okay, thank you very much through you, Chair. Um, good morning, board members. You have before you a draft 2019 annual report. It is almost in its final stage, but needs to be prepared for print and uh, go through some final proofing. It will be circulated to all staff on Friday, um, and we expect to have a final to be posted online within the next two weeks. So it is a work in progress. We are on, on version 16 at this moment. Um, don't feel that you need to stay up all night looking for typos on our behalf, um, although we do welcome uh, your uh, feedback and we'll entertain any comments you have, uh, and you can send those directly to communications. Aside from that, I really need to thank a lot of people for their hard work in pulling this publication together. Uh, it really was a team effort that began with a call out to the company at large. Each department submitted their top accomplishments from last year. Uh, and, you know, we really had some great, great stories. Uh, we had so much content to pick from. Uh, and then Chandra, thankfully, worked closely together with communications to refine the layout and the flow. Um, and a lot of the heavy lifting on the design obviously landed on uh, Robert Chulo. He did a wonderful job um, making it look stunning. What you see here is a culmination of all the efforts of our hardworking and resilient staff, as well as the board and CAO from 2019. And we really believe that we have a comprehensive, clear and detailed framework of that work, including things like financials uh, and taking into consideration some of the AG recommendations. This tells the story of the NPCA and it recognizes our 60 years of conservation work in our watershed. Uh, it includes various metrics and KPIs, but please note we did review the annual reports from other CAs and we acknowledge that it is common to see a focus on corporate priorities uh, with high level KPIs, uh, which is what we are lacking this year in this report. We will work towards these metrics through the strategic plan process uh, to implement these in 2021. And ultimately the strat plan process will provide us an opportunity to update some of these key things like our mission and vision statements, our about us, 
develop those corporate priorities that are going to be uh, essential to demonstrating our success on our impact on the watershed, as well as overall themes. So with that, I thank you for your time and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Renee. Are there any comments or questions, please? Seeing none, sure. Renee did, oh, turn her down, Stu, thank you. Like, I feel like I'm in a stadium with them. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Got to turn it up, got to turn it down. Uh, so I take it this is the draft report? You are correct. Okay, because it doesn't say draft on anything that I've seen so far. But let me compliment you. You're getting much better at annual report. Well, I thank you very much, much to you. And the picture thank of you very all much is superb and that's an inside joke that one was for you <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when will, say, sorry. do we get to comment on this do we get the right concerns uh or is staff going to simply proceed to press renee uh, staff at large have yet to see this they will be circulated a pdf on friday so we that will give us the opportunity to um, make sure that there are no errors uh small number changes um member fior already caught one for us last night thank you for that uh it is in draft form today to the board it'll be in draft form to the staff on friday um, and as i mentioned we uh, we need to swap out some of the photos in a more of a high res resolution for the print um, there are some messages in the front from the CAO and uh, the board chair that we still need to add. So we are about two weeks away from it going to print. Please send me any commentary uh, or recommendations directly to either myself or Erica or Rob, and we will do our best to accommodate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, anyone? And then as Renee said, if you have any um, and she said typos or things like that, then she'd be welcome to have your comments uh, be emailed to her. Okay, so I've got uh, Member Bilsma and Member Clark uh, moving it and seconding it to be received. Any opposition? Anybody opposed? Hearing none, it's carried. We're on to the discussion items, um, and I'm keeping an eye on the time, folks. It's 11.20 and we have two members that have to go to a Niagara Escarpment Commission meeting at 12.30. So uh, we need to move along. Uh, we have report number FA-14-20. This is potential variance process for the MPCA policy document, policies for the administration of Ontario Regulation 155-06 and the Planning Act update. Dave DeLuce is here to answer any questions. I believe you had, is it a, a a presentation, Dave, or were you just willing to answer questions? Uh, three, Madam Chair, no, there was no presentation. It was just a question. Okay. And hopefully everybody read the report and they have their questions already answered or they have some quick questions to do now. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, it's moved by Member Coon peterson and seconded by Member Cridlin that it be approved. Any opposition? Seeing none, it's carried. Now we're on to FA 15-20. Member Woodhouse, I have you down as the first comment. Um, this is also, I believe this uh, is referring to a letter that was received last night uh, regarding the uh, permitting policy and it's specifically for septic tanks. So uh, Dave DeLuce also is on hand if we have any questions or concerns and I have Member Fior, seconded by Member Foster to re to approve it. Member Woodhouse. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question relates to, because it, it seems to me that uh, the biggest challenge that uh, everyone is facing here is the 30 meter setback. I noted uh, that uh, prior to the, us setting a 30 meter setback, uh, let me back up first, we're, we're talking about septic systems uh, from wetlands, 30 meters. Um, I noted that it used to be 100 or 120 at one point, not sure what the exact number was, but the 30 seems to be a kind of standard, a standard uh, accepted uh, distance separation. My question is to uh, staff in terms of the, um, uh, the condition of soil and the types of soil and the migration and, 
course, that's the concern is the migration of any septic into the wetland. Is that taken into consideration when that measurement is uh, established? Okay, thank you. Um, just to be clear, to let everybody know for clarity purposes, for this report, the staff are actually recommending that um, recommendation number three, that we defer all policy changes, which means it stays at 30 meters. It doesn't go less or 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 more uh, until the, basically till Bill 108. So I just want to put that prefer that uh, context out there. So Dave, do you have an answer for Member Woodhouse, please? Three, Madam Chair. Um, the setback, well, maybe to back up a second. So Member Woodhouse mentioned 120 meter setback versus a 30 meter setback. When you read the regulation, there is no actual setback. There is an area of influence. That's probably the best way to describe it. So that area of influence for provincially significant wetlands, as well as wetlands greater than two hectares in size is 120 meters. So that simply means that a conservation authority can regulate out to 120 meters from those types of wetlands. Now, the 30 meter um, setback that you see in a policy, my understanding is when our new regulation came out, and by new I mean back in 2006, leading up to that, staff had recommended to the province that 30 meters be established as the area of influence for all wetlands. And that was based, from my understanding, on uh, the various environmental impact studies that had come in with various developments. And all of those studies, the largest setback ever noted was 30 meters. Um, the province rejected that and simply stated that the area of influence is 120 meters, but through your policies, you can establish uh, specific setbacks that a conservation authority would like to see. So that's where 120 meters comes into play. So there was no actual 120 meter setback. The 30 meters in our policy I don't have any specific background on to whether or not that really took any science into account. The original uh, idea of reducing that setback down to 30 or from 30 down to 15 for brand new septic systems was to afford a, a property owner the opportunity to demonstrate through a study that the reduction is not going to have a negative impact on the wetland. So in, through that environmental impact study or hydrology study, that would look at groundwater migration and other impacts or potential impacts to the wetland and propose any mitigation that may be appropriate or just come up with uh, the answer that no, this in whatever situation could not be supported. Okay, Member Woodhouse. Uh, well, yes, and I thank you for that. And, that. and I guess the lack of science in terms of establishing that benchmark uh, is of concern to me because it. It, it, you know, not all situations are, you know, 30 meters. You know, there's 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 aspects that uh, change and can dramatically change that necessity. And I and I don't want to get too uh, uh, detailed in this in terms of us having to do, you know, core samples and all the other that would be required to be able to get those scientific uh, calculations and measurements. But uh, I, I just I just want to make sure that we're not just fixed on the 30 meters because there are, situ there are situations that change from time to time. I'm certain that uh, maybe that's not necessary. Maybe it can be 25 meters. Maybe it can be 35 meters or whatever. That was my main concern. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments and concerns? So, oh, thank you. I'm sorry. Member Halinga, you did have your hand up and I did write it down. I just didn't look at my notes. Member Halinga. Thank you. And um, again, I want to compliment staff on uh, addressing some of the things that I was going to say and uh, Member Woodhouse for also asking the same questions. Uh, first, I want to I guess, uh, repeat what um, some of the mayors have said about the Niagara Escarpment Commission and plans to change things on the under the Escarpment Commission regulations for setbacks and development. And you know when you buy the property, what is on that property, you know the NPCA regulations when you buy the property. So you are assuming the regulations for that piece of property when you purchase it. However, as 
Member Woodhouse has said, you have to also know the science. And part of that science is that no two wetlands are the same. Um, hydrology is so independent of a site or so dependent on a site and independent of all the others. So the need for an EA. because um, in some cases you might be upstream of the wetland, some cases you would be downstream of the wetland. Uh, you may have an impact at 60 meters where if you are up downstream, you may only get the impact from the wetland and not impact it. So the motion here is to wait until the province comes up with a uh, direction and I agree with that and then we can revisit based on particulars. The letter request that they do an EIS, I would suggest that that EIS, whoever does it, is selected by the NPCA or that the NPCA do a peer review of the EIS so that we get an appropriate scientific opinion. And uh, that's all. Okay, thank you. Um, Chandra, I'm just going to go to you just to be clear. Does the NPCA have a list of um, approved consultants, if you will, to carry on this work that we can actually do that uh, recommendation to, to applicants? Thank you, Madam Chair. Before I respond to that, and we can certainly uh, do a peer review on the EAS, that's not an issue. Okay. I just want David to uh, weigh in or Darren um, as to what the implications are, given that the policy is no development in 30 meter buffers. Uh, is the board directing staff to now deviate from that policy and look at this? So David, David, can you comment on that? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess that is a, a call for the board. There's a recommendation in the report before the board. We were recommending option three. And the reason we were recommending option three is, again, with the impending um, Bill 108 regulation that is supposed to come sometime. I don't know what the schedule is now with the uh, COVID situation. But we're still hoping that'll come this year. Um, there are some other policies we would like to look at in our wetland section at the very least so we thought it would be more appropriate to defer this particular item to a more wholesome review of at least the wetland policies but um with respect to environmental impact studies for uh, the wetlands um, to member halinga's comment certainly we would be requiring us we would provide a scope or at the very least require a scoping review of the EIS before it's submitted. So that simply is our chance to say, here's what you need to look at. As part of that, uh, we would very likely look for a feature water-based balance component to assess what are the inputs and outputs to the wetland. And again, to make sure that there's no hydrologic impacts to the wetland. Uh, and again, that would be our chance to make sure that what the EIS needs to look at is made clear to the applicant. And then that way uh, it ensures when the study comes in, it, addresses what we needed to address. That doesn't guarantee that it will be approved. It just simply directs the applicant um, and what they have to actually look at. Okay, thank you. Chandra, everything okay? Sorry, I, I still want board direction on, uh, we have a request, we have a letter in front of us um, that is asking us to uh, pick a different option, there is a delegate, they couldn't delegate, they've sent a letter. And then there's a staff request in front of us. So I need clear direction from the board. Are you asking us to uh, leave the policy as is until uh, similar to what staff are recommending? And at the same time, you're asking us to consider this specific application that is in front of us? Um, okay, so maybe I, I threw that monkey wrench in and I apologize. So at the very beginning, I said that the staff is recommending number three. Uh, we can receive this letter and the letter and the applicant will go follow the process that everyone else has to follow if they're not within that 30 meters until such time the one, Bill 108 comes in and then we can reevaluate that policy. 
Am I getting that correct? Correct. David, do you want to weigh on that? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Yeah, just to clarify with respect to that letter, um, that letter is for a specific property in which the applicant is, the property wouldn't be developable based on the current policy. So the applicant, uh, or I should say proponent at this point, there hasn't been an application made, but they're aware of this policy review that we were conducting and the letter they submitted was for the sake of their comments or feedback on this overall policy amendment. It's not meant to specifically be for that property. It's for the policy as a whole, just as anybody else's comment. Thank you for clarifying. So folks, in front of you is the report. Um, it's oh, Ken. sorry. I'm sorry. It's Ken. Can I comment? Thank you. Yep. Um, so I've got a couple of quick comments. Uh, the first one having to do with uh, how this uh, item is labeled. It's called a housekeeping uh, amendment. Okay. Um, in section 12.7.3 of the NPCA policy document, it actually defines housekeeping amendments as minor changes to formatting, numbering, and definitions. And I think what's in front of us today doesn't really meet that definition. This is really a significant policy change. So I would ask on a go forward basis that there be uh, more clarity with respect to how these things are, are, are brought forward. The uh, second item is um, we just had a really robust discussion about water quality monitoring and the need to really improve things. And, and it just appears to me that, uh, you know, considering uh, reducing setbacks in wetlands is quite inconsistent with that whole discussion. Uh, and th then my third comment really goes to what Mr. Deleuze said, uh, that uh, should we uh, proceed ahead with this, uh, sorry, uh, that I will support option uh, three mm -hmm. in the document, not only because of the uh, bill of weight, but, I, but also what Mr. Deleuze said, that we need to look at all of our wetland policies together. You can't just pick out one and look at it. So uh, I, I, I will fully support the motion but uh, just uh, have that additional comment that uh, when that review happens, I would like us to look at all of our wetland policies, not just this specific one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, I may have confused this whole thing and I apologize right from the get go. We're dealing with the report in front of us right now. The recommendation that staff is asking you for to approve is recommendation number three. So are there any comments or questions about recommending number three? Yeah, I'm I'm a little bit confused. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Me. So. Um, oh, sorry, Brian. Go ahead. When I'm reading the report that's before us, I'm trying to understand how this letter that has come in is associated with this recommendation. Is it just a comment on this recommendation, or are they asking us to make specific changes to their own application? And this is my apology. This one came in very late and I was led to believe that this was regarding this policy. So I'll ask Chandra uh, to uh, comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, they, the letter is in relation to this specific report asking the board to reconsider staff recommendation. Basically, that's how I would say that. Uh, David, do you want to add to that? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, again, I would just state that uh, this letter that came in yesterday is just simply comments on the proposed change to uh, the policy regarding wet or um, septic systems in proximity to wetlands. There is no change. They're asking for it to say the same. So go ahead, Councilor or, uh, Member Clark. And so, and so as I understand it, currently we have a 30 meter setback. And the proposal is that it could be changed to 15 meters with requisite studies proving that there's no damage to the the waterway. Is that correct? Correct. And so what's being proposed here is that we defer that policy change until we review all wetland policies following the establishment of the new regulation by the province. Correct. Is the province proposing a change to the 30 meter setback? Uh, we don't know, but the regs are in front of the province, so more regulations will come out that will provide conservation authorities an opportunity based on those regulations to update their policies. 
And what David is saying in his report is that will be an opportunity for NPCA to look at any inconsistencies inconsist across Ontario or our own policies and come up with more standard wet end policies. Yeah. So, Clark. Thank you. So do we have the rationale that was used initially when the 30 meter setback was put as a requirement? I would defer that to David. David, what was the rationale? Is it more uh, high risk because it's a septic bed? Through you, Madam Chair. Again, I'm not sure exactly why there was a 30 meter setback put in on uh, new septic systems in relation to wetlands. That goes back to prior to 2011. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't with the CA, and again, I don't have any notes from our files on what what the science was, what the rationale was for 30 meters for new se uh, septic systems. Member Clark. Okay, so I'll support the deferral, but I'd like to put on the record um, if there is going to be a recommendation to change it to 15 meters. I need to see the science proving that there's no risk. Because if we're going to suggest for a moment that we're going to go from 30 meters to 15 meters and just require the landowner to, to come up with a study verifying that there's uh, the 15 meter setback is sufficient, that is not going to be an issue. And here's the study. Um, I've been around a long time and Consultants are a dime a dozen, and you'd be surprised how many hired guns will will come on board and say exactly what you want them to say. So I look to our staff to provide us professional advice based on the science, and I trust our staff to come forth with a recommendation that makes sense. And if they say the 30 meter makes sense, and that needs to be maintained, then that's what we need to do allowing that change based on a hired guns report, I have concerns about. So just putting that out there now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brenda, it's Mel. Thank you, Mel, go ahead. Um, uh, I concur with that. And, and I guess the concern that I have here of even uh, referring this is that, that uh, really don't know how the 30 meters was established and I have I have a lot of problems with this and that uh, you know if it's if it's based on uh, on some science and some uh, some measurements that uh, you know are are supported by you know the professionals then then that's one thing but but I'm not hearing that I'm just I'm just thinking that it sounds like somebody said well 100 feet or 98 feet 30 meters that'll that'll cut it because it facilitates uh, moving this thing from from a further distance or whatever and it became came adopted across across the system it seems so I, I would prefer to, to uh, yeah, I'll, and I'll support the staff recommendation because obviously okay. the province is going to do this but the amount of time it's going to take for that to happen versus us not even knowing why 30 meters is is relevant is is a, a concern to me okay thank you. Any other comments before we uh, approve the uh, deferral? Um, it's Bill. Thank you. Go Bill ahead. Rapley. Um, I um, I would assume the TRCA, I worked with them for many, many, many years, and they have used this 30 meter um, uh, setting for uh, many, many years. And I would only assume the number of those type of things that they've been involved with that they would have a huge amount of information uh, that would support why they're sticking to the 30 meter as i understand it um, and charter worked for them so perhaps maybe she would comment but i i think i would go with what they've been doing based on their the size of their operation the number of years they've been working with it and the science and technology they have to back up everything that they're doing okay and member helenga 
can um, unmute yourself. Can everybody else please mute? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I agree with option three uh, on the basis that that will give us and our staff time to uh, re read and find out the rationale the ministry is using. And I really appreciated their list and comparisons of the regulations and all the other conservation authorities that responded. There's also a, a need to recognize that there are numerous different septic systems and each one has different setback se separation requirements. So that also has to be included Uh, recommendation and I support option three. Okay, thank you. So was there anybody here opposed to uh, option number three? And if not, then we can go with the vote. Anyone opposed? Uh, Chair Johnson, I just have a quick question. It's the oh, sure. Go ahead. Um, with respect to when, it, um, if we move forward, for example, with option three, which is a deferral, um, and staff comes back to us with the report, I'm, I'm maybe echoing uh, fellow members, but really within that report, um, some rationale as to the decision of the 30 meter buffer. And um, like Member Rapley said, we could look to, um, to Toronto and, and see why they've, they've chosen that or, or why they've, they've used that for all these years. And then within that staff report, um, after it, it moves forward, how can we better communicate that on our on our website um, so that the public understands the rationale behind the 30 meters and it not just being an arbitrary number, but backed by science. Right. And I'm seeing Chandra shaking her head. Yes, I think that was the intent. Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, Chandra. I'm shaking my head because I'm trying to figure out how to respond to that. Have you not? We're not deferring the item to bring our staff report back, just for clarity. We are deferring to make any changes to the policy as it stands until Bill 108 regulations come out and we have time to look at all the wetland policies. So that clarity is important for members right now. I don't think there is an expectation right now for us to bring back a report to talk about why a 30 meter buffer was set in the existing policy. This will all be done along with other conservation authority as part of the bigger review of all the policies after Bill 108. So that clarity is important for board members to understand. I think what we are voting on is to accept the staff report as is with option three, which means the 30 meter buffer policy stands until Bill 108 comes out, whether it's six months, one year, or whatever time frame it is. What I'm also hearing is members would like to know the science behind setting 30 meters. I think it will really depend from site to site and the watershed of the conservation authority I'm, I'm happy to look at that, but I don't know how much time we want to spend doing that right now. And is it relevant at this stage? Because we're not, there are no decisions in front of us immediately, uh, you know, to review an application with that. I'm, I'm just trying to bring some clarity to the issue here. So I think what you're voting on is to accept staff recommendation on option right. three which is to defer any changes to the 30 meter setback for septics until Bill 108. Everybody should understand that. Right. Okay. Um, member Fi her? wait a minute, please. Member Fior, are you okay with that? Um, I am okay with that and thank you. And through you, Chair, thank you, uh, Chandra, for, for clarifying that um, further. Um, and I think it also speaks to once Bill 108, all of that information is shared, is how we can um, ensure that it's communicated effectively to the public so that they understand it and details like this um, are, are easily understood by the public. So 
that's what I was um, speaking towards, and, and I don't expect another report to be to be brought forth. But I think if there was those questions about why the 30 meters, um, it's not that we need to to dig deep and do a research on it right now. But if if we're asking why the 30 meters, I would think the public as well would, and hopefully um, Bill 108 can answer some of those questions for us, and we just need to effectively communicate it uh, to the public. Hopefully, I've um, understood that clearly. Yeah, you have, and I and I apologize because I think that it should have been the direction right from the get go. So I appreciate the clarity as well. Um, I heard somebody shout out. I don't know who it was. Councillor Johnson. Okay, um, so, uh, thank you, members, uh, clerk. So was the fifteen meters? Is this a proposed change that the province is coming forward? I'm just, I'm still, I still don't understand the genesis of the change to fifteen meters. That coming from. It yeah, was, do. Go ahead. Sorry, um, David can speak to that, but let me just tell you it had come up uh, in 2019 around June. There is some background on that in the report that staff should consider uh, changing that. David, is that correct? Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, that's correct. There was a report uh, last year that had initially started this whole process to amend the septic policy, and it was proposing a reduction down to 15, and then we had to go out and do public consultation. But the 15 meters, uh, that came from, it's a combination of things. The building code has a minimum of 15 meters from a wetland for septic systems, and then also several other conservation authorities, and I believe there's a table in the report that outlines some of those that have 15 meters as a minimum. So that was, again, just kind of a, um, starting point, but that would be subject to doing an environmental impact study to confirm that there's no negative impact to the wetland. Thank you. Okay. So it's sitting in front of you, please. And this is for option number three, that things stay status quo until such time Bill 108 comes in and then it can be reviewed. Any opposed? Seeing none, then it's carried. Thank you very much, Dave and, and Chandra for that. Report number FA1720, this is the final draft client service standards for plan and permit review. Darren McKenzie is on hand if anybody wants to um, ask questions. It's moved by member Halenga and second by member Hewson to approve it. Any questions or comments, please? Okay, hearing none, uh, so any opposed? Hearing none. It is passed. Thanks, Darren. If I may uh, just, sure. Thank you, Member Johnson. And I had everything all ready to go, but thank you for approving it. And I really look forward to implementing this and providing customer service to our exceptional customer service to all of our stakeholders and making sure that you know, we get things done and look after everybody in this watershed. So thank you. Well, it's because you wrote the report so well, everybody understood it completely. They didn't have any questions. Good for you. So now we're on to um, report number FA2020. This is the Walker's Creek and Beamer Creek in the city of St. Catharines, the floodplain mapping update. This is a formal adoption. It's moved by member Haringa, or yeah, Haringa, and, uh, oh, sorry. It's moved by member Engrero and member Kaywell. And Steve Miller is on hand if anybody has any questions or comments. Bring none. Brenda, it's oh, Ken. Thank you, Member Kaywell. Go ahead. I'm I'm not exactly clear. You're being asked to approve here. Okay. It sounds like the uh, the floodplain maps that have come out of a study that was done. Okay. Um, and if that is the case. Uh, I, I would think we need to actually understand what the engineering study was that actually led to the development of those maps. And this sounds very much like the discussion we had on the Welland floodplain mapping a couple of months ago. So are, are we being asked to uh, uh, approve maps based on the technical soundness of an engineering study that we have not seen or being party to? 
Okay, so I'll go to Steve Miller, please, because uh, he was prepared to do a presentation on this. So go ahead, Steve. Um, thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. The um, direct staff has received is that um, prior to utilizing any new flood map for regulation, it is to seek board approval. Um, we had retained an engineering firm. Uh, we had completed an engineering study. Uh, we had circulated it for public comment, um, held a uh, public information session, um, received uh, favorable feedback. So now the last um, step in that whole process is to board um, adoption of these flood lines, then we will proceed to use them, update the old ones, and uh, regulate under 15506. Thank you, Mr. Our member Kaywell. So, so I, I'm still not clear. Do we, so the study that actually led to this, okay, um, have we had that study peer reviewed? Uh, do we know the soundness of that study? Because, you know, great that the consultation process went, went well, but the accountability that I think is being put on us is to say that, yes, it was a sound study uh, that led to the development of these uh, flood maps. And uh, as a member, I don't know that I could say that today. So. The, um, the study was, uh, was reviewed. Uh, Conservation Authority staff are satisfied with the engineering soundness of it is that it be adopted. Um, should the board choose not to adopt it, then the only other recourse would be to send it out for peer review. Thank you, Member Kaywell. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brenda, it's Ed. Oh, good. Member Smith? Um, yeah, I'm just wondering again on this study then, um, because I remember the uh, with the Welland River uh, floodplain, we basically had two options, one that showed um, dramatic changes in the floodplain, or maybe I shouldn't say the word dramatic, but significant, and one that showed uh, the floodplain remaining more or less the same as the year 1985 or something like that. And we discussed how the public was satisfied with the 1985 lines. And I remember leaving that discussion personally with a bitter taste, um, just thinking, we're supposed to be doing this by science, not by public sentiment. And so I'd like to know, like for Walker's Creek and Beaver Creek, these maps or th these floodplain maps that we're being asked to approve here, they, is there significant change from what the, what the old floodplain lines were? Or again, are going with public sentiment was along one line and so we're, we're more or less taking a path of what I interpret as least public resistance. And for, forgive me for being blunt like that, but I don't know how else to say it. That's the way I feel about it. Okay, um, I did hear the staff say that though that they had approved it prior, but go ahead, Steve. Um, of course, through you, Madam Chair. And so to answer the question about the nature of the change, one of the reasons we undertook the update was uh, conditions had changed at the very uh, of Walker's Creek where it enters Lake Ontario, a channel was dug and it has since over the years widened, eroded, and that has allowed more um, water to get into the lake more quickly. What that has done is reduced the elevation of the floodplain on Beamer Creek and the lower part of Walker Creek. On Walker's Creek at Cindy Drive, there's a gauge station, an NPCA stream gauge station with a weir. That weir has um, kept the level of the, of the water constant and the level of the floodplain constant. Upstream of Cindy Drive, the flows were calculated to be much the same as they were back in the, uh, the old city, and the floodplain is uh, the same. So, on Walker's Creek, the flood line are the same as the old There, The update has shown that. On Beamer's Creek, there is a reduction because of um, a bigger opening. 
draining into Lake Ontario. Member Smith. My concern is, and, and it's anecdotal, but here in St. Catharines, there's been a lot of complaints lately about the um, the increased flooding around Walker Street. That we've had some really bad events over the last four or five years. Now, I don't I don't have the historical, you know, I can't tell what it was 30 years ago or something. But so, I'm, is it just my spider senses are are off on this then? Steve, spider senses. Through you, Madam Chair, um, there has been there has been flood. And some of those large storms that had happened uh, in the recent past, they were used um, to validate the engineering firm's model. So we took the real storm information. We had that the duration and magnitude. Um, we plugged that into the uh, the the model of the engineering firm. Uh, got a result how high. The uh, uh, Walker's Creek would get during that storm, and it matched uh, the photos that uh, local residents sent in to us at the height of the uh, how high that storm got, and the elevation registered on our stream gauge station at Cindy Drive. The um, floodplain mapping was done by Stantec Engineering, a preeminent engineering firm. It was reviewed by Conservation Authority engineering staff. We were satisfied with the results. Um, the uh, uh, public had a chance to, uh, we posted the, the study on the website for 30 days. Folks were invited to download it, review it, submit questions, come to the um, public open house with their questions, meet the engineering team, um, Stantec, meet Conservation Authority staff. And um, all this happened. Uh, there were no concerns by the public with the results. Um, so now, we are uh, um, asking that the results be adopted. The results of the updated floodplain mapping be adopted. Thank you, I, Member that, Smith. That, that answers my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, please? Question. Oh, thank you. Um, I got Member Halinga waving to me, and somebody just shouted out. Who was the other person? Mel. Okay, I'll go to Halinga, and then we'll go to uh, Member Woodhouse. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Johnson. Uh, to uh, staff, uh, Mr. Miller, the you said that the uh, new modeling showed that it was generally the same upstream, but near the outlet there was a reduced uh, flood line. Attracted flood line that uh, it might open it up for more development. Through you, Madam Chair, Member Halinga, you were cutting in. Note, I I couldn't get your question. Yeah, I thought so too, but I thought it was just my internet. Oh, maybe it was my internet. Well, okay. that's okay. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes, uh, because of the comment that the downstream was um, in contracted flood lines, does that mean it will open it up for additional development in that area? Thank you. Did you get that, Steve? Uh, yes, through you, uh, through you, Madam Chair. Most of the um, lands uh, contained by the floodplain are owned by the city of St. Catharines. There is some uh, lands along Beamer Creek that um, may be open, uh, available for additional development. Yes. Member Halenga. Okay, I, that concerns me because it was opened up because of somebody's uh, intentional removal of a dune in order to get to that point. And I don't condone uh, removals of things in order to open up uh, land that wasn't naturally available. I'm sorry, I heard you say that you're not opposed to someone opening up land for development. I, I'm paraphrasing, mind you. No, uh, just okay. the opposite. Okay, that's why that's why you're cutting it out. I do me. not condone that that um, activity. And as a result of that activity, it has opened up 
additional lands, which I don't think should be uh, condoned. Right. Steve, any comment on that? Um, through you, Madam Chair, most of uh, uh, the properties are uh, residential, single family uh, properties. Um, there are development that might be um, the ability to put an addition on the house or, or something uh, similar in nature. There uh, are not uh, in the area of Beamer Creek any large blocks that can now be um, uh, constructed with condominiums or apartments. Small single family residential dwellings. Okay, thank you. Member Halanga? Yes, uh, I can ag agree with um, climate change affecting high water levels, but I don't think we should be reducing the flood levels in the downstream areas because other things can change so that it could revert back. So um, I'm, I'm not in agreement with um, the contraction of the flood lines. Okay, um, going forward, I would suggest that either you approve the report or you or you um, oppose the report. No, on that basis, I will be opposed to it. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions, please? If, if I might clarify, Madam sorry, Chair. Mel Woodhouse. Mel Woodhouse. Oh, sorry, who? Uh, Steve? Yes, if I might clarify, um, when we talk about the downstream, um, downstream, water course uh, discharging into a great lake. There are two floodplains. Uh, the, the one floodplain we're looking at is the riverine water course, the water course, um, the flooding associated with Walker Creek and Beamer Creek. When you start getting to a great lake, you start looking at the flooding associated with the 100 year level of Lake Ontario. And there is a point um, where one supersedes the other. So when um, Member Halinga was talking about climate change, I assume he was talking about the level of the, the lake. And that, that is indeed a concern. We, we have that mapped. We know what the 100 year level of Lake Ontario is. But what we're dealing with here is when Lake Ontario is at its average level and we do get a 100 year storm on the Walker and Beamer Creek watershed, what's the extent of that floodplain? We've mapped it and we found that there is a, um, the flood levels have gone down as a result of more water getting into Lake Ontario at a quicker rate. Okay, thank you. Um, Member Halenga, that was actually in a response for you. Are you, are you uh, want to respond back or we can see the, the, the floor? Well, you, I will not be supporting the uh, okay. reduction of uh, the floodplain on the basis that that will send a signal that, okay, I can um, reduce my flood lines by providing a larger outlet to uh, a larger channel to the outlet. And uh, I really discourage that type of activity. Okay, thank you. And um, we're at to Member Woodhouse, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I share some of the same concerns. I know a number of people in that area that have uh, commented to me about their concerns about uh, not only a hundred year storm, but uh, storms in general, where there's a, you know, a sudden uh, downpour that it's caused all kinds of uh, backup flooding issues. Uh, the city of St. Catharines, as I understand, has no developable land anymore within the urban service areas. And therefore, it's for the last 15 years, it's been putting a lot of pressure for infilling and also uh, higher density uh, developments. And um, uh, my, co my concern is, is that when you, when you see where the water comes out at the uh, uh, club, is it Social? I'm not sure the name of the club, where they, where they widened that uh, entrance into the lake, just because they did that, uh, and I agree with the previous speaker that uh, we're really, we're really, you know, saying the same thing across all drainage uh, plans across across the region. If we can widen them up, well, every ditch you can widen, you can make more space for more water. But uh, I don't think that this is a this is an answer. I, I think the concern is more related to the fact that uh, uh, we're. 
for the responsibilities for maintaining the, uh, the proper uh, runoff, et cetera, is, lies with the city. And uh, uh, from what I understand from people who live down there, that uh, that's not very well maintained. Uh, there's by complaint only that there is no uh, plan in terms of maintaining proper drainage. And I stand to be corrected, Steve, if that's the case. Um, so, so for those reasons, I would be opposed to uh, this as well. I, I think that uh, it's something that can come back to bite us and, uh, and affect a lot of people needlessly. And then we're going to be digging that channel even deeper to create the ability to be able to handle that kind of sudden on water uh, thing. Because culverts that are under some of these roads, et cetera, um, I know the one that comes out right at the creek mouth there off of... Um, was it the Cindy, Cindy Drive? Right by that restaurant there. If you've gone down there and looked at that thing when there's a storm coming through, it is a tremendous turbulence that runs through there and is eroding all of the banks along on, on both sides of it. I don't know if the folks have actually looked at it, but I have. So I, I would be opposed to this for that reason. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments and questions before we move to the vote? Brenda, can a follow up question? Yes, sir. Uh, so if we approve these, I'm assuming that the flood lines are the lines on one side of the flood line you can develop on the other side of the flood line you cannot develop. Um, to the extent that we approve this and somebody develops in the proper side of the flood line and it floods, do we bear any responsibility or have any liability? So I'm assuming this is a general question on anything that happens when we put a flood line up. So Steve, can you answer that please? Yes, thank you. Um, through you, Madam Chair. What we identify is extent of flooding that exists during the 100 year storm event. And so the 100 year flood line, four inches of approximately in 12 hours. Will there be more severe storm events? Absolutely. Absolutely. What I like to think of that 100 year line um, as a compromise line, okay? Between keeping people away from the water course and keeping them safe, and a compromise between allowing lands to be opened up for development. That was the um, level of risk that the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority chose to accept back in 89 when it chose your storm as its regulatory storm. So if someone builds outside of the flood line legally, okay, and they get flooded out, it's quite possible that they would get flooded out by a storm event more severe than the hundred year storm event. And we've seen that again, hundred year event, four inches of rain in 12 hours, Michigan, Michigan got um Okay, so these storm events do happen. Thank you. Sorry, sir, did you just finish that question? So my question was, fine, they get flooded out. Are we liable because we're the ones who said, here's where the flood line is, so. Sorry about that, thank you. Uh, Steve? Yeah, through you, Madam Chair. We are responsible for the location of the 100 year flood line. If they get flooded out by a storm more severe than the 100 year storm, then the Conservation Authority would not be in a position of liability because we are mandated only to identify the extent of the 100 year flood and regulate works within that. Okay, I think that Member Kaywell, and if I can interrupt here, was asking if it is a flood issue, even if it's within the 100 year storm parameters, is the Conservation Authority responsible? And the Conservation Authority allows certain works to be under the 100 year flood line. Absolutely. In addition to a house, 500 square feet. Um, and, and outbuilding. Yeah, that that is allowed. Would the Conservation Authority um, liable no no we only identify the uh the flood line in order to direct development to the best of our ability away from it 
Thank you. Member Kaywell. I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments before we move to approval? Okay, so all those who are opposed, I believe we had Member Halenga, Member Woodhouse, anybody else? Member Kaywell? Member Smith. Member Smith. Rapley. Member Rapley. Can we mute everybody else, please, unless you want to speak? Member Five. Member Fior as well. Member Fior, that's six. I think you had Member right. Fior. Number seven is member Wright. So if I got everybody correct, it was member Kaywell, member Smith, member Halenga, member Woodhouse, member Wright, and member Fior. Did I miss one? Oh, a member Rapley, sorry. Have we got that grant? Is grant online still? My apologies. I'm talking away with with it muted, of course. Yes, we've got that noted. And is it carried then, uh, Grant, with seven opposed? It is carried. Thank you. Okay, folks, we're on the pandemic report. Uh, this is to be presented, uh, I believe, uh, Chandra. And it was FA2520. This is the pandemic report. This is documentation that was uh, distributed under a separate cover. So, Chandra, you're on. Um, I, I could start, Madam Chair, and uh, have Misty and Liz uh, or Adam, they're all uh, here, to comment on various components of the report. This is, uh, as, as you've seen, I've, I've given various updates to the board. So what we were trying to articulate in this report is going forward from my previous update as to what our uh, financial implications are and lots has changed since the last board meeting. So we are now in the recovery phase and, and we are starting to uh, look at our recovery planning, what that looks like and what health and safety measures we have put in place for staff. So the report is in front of you. Uh, if you like, staff can give you a more detailed version or we can take questions. Okay, why don't we start with questioning and then we have all three staff that are on, on board waiting to answer those questions. Are there any questions so far on the documentation that was sent? Member Halenga, I got you waving. Go ahead. Thank you. And yes, immediately after the last board meeting, I posed a question about um, staff working from home. I know we had provided them with all the IT and I asked about uh, the physical needs and I'm going to just uh, refer to uh, our staff member, Misty Ferrusi, to indicate what and repeat what she answered to me. Thank you. I agree, it was quite a good answer. Misty, good morning. Good morning, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, and Member Holinga, thank you for bringing that forward. Um, it's appreciative to know that our members are thinking of the health and safety of our staff. Um, so that is also always been the top priority for us as well. Uh, so some of the items that we had when staff uh, went to work from home, we did provide everybody with information on how to set up a proper ergonomic workstation. Uh, we offered people the use of any uh, office tools that might assist with that. So if they had uh, a chair that would be better suited for their workstation that they wanted to bring home. Um, we were open to those requests and allowed uh, those requests to go through and really anything else that anybody brought forward as a way to um, aid their home station setup. Uh, beyond that, as we continue through the process and working from home uh, through the health and safety committee, we are looking at what other resources uh, and checklists we can provide to staff that are working from home so that they are set up in an appropriate manner that um, will not affect their health that will have them continue to be to be safe in their home workplaces now. Thank you. Member Halenga. No, that's that's great. And uh, I really appreciated the response and the uh, fact that our staff are being taken care of. Thank you. And I'm sure they appreciate that as well. Uh, any other comments or questions? 
Well, and I think that uh, on behalf of all the board, we can say to the staff, thank you so much for all your hard work. I think that we're all working harder from home than we did at our offices. Um, so no other questions or comments. I have it moved by Member McKenzie, seconded by Member Metcalf, that it be approved and received. No opposition. Then it's carried. So now we have a new heading. This is our committee reports. And for only one committee for this, uh, for this month, we have the Audit and Budget Committee. And Chair Ken Kaywell is here to answer any questions. But we have two uh, items for approval first out of those minutes, and then we can receive the minutes. So item one is the report. Sorry. The item one is the report FA2420. This is the 2019 audited financial statements. And we have the F2, FA2620 audit and budget committee terms of reference and their work plan. So it is moved by, I lost my last. It is moved by, hang on a second. Uh, member Bl uh, Bilsma and Member Clark that we approve both items. Is there any comments or uh, if, if Chair Kaywell would like to make a comment before we finish? So thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, the audit financial statements, These. this is really the motion that goes along with the presentation made by Mr. Plugers of uh, KPMG. The Audit and Budget Committee did uh, review the same presentation you had and uh, had no concerns and is actually recommending that the board approve these audited financial statements. Thank you. Any comments or questions before we move to approval, please? I have a question. Yep, Member Hewson. Um, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm just curious what facilitated the um, changes to the um, terms of reference in terms of renaming the committee. Thank you, Member Kaywell. Would you like to respond? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, as uh, we uh, we look to uh, really clarify the purpose of the committee, uh, one of the things that uh, we saw that uh, things have evolved since the uh, the last go round of uh, of the terms of reference of the budget committee, and uh, it has a broader oversight. Uh, we believe it has a broader oversight than just looking at the uh, audit report and the budget. Okay, uh, there are uh, other financial controls that uh, need uh, oversight, and there are a number of key uh, financial priorities. Uh, one of them that uh, Lise mentioned uh, early on and was highlighted in the uh, uh, by the auditor, which is the whole asset management or capital planning responsibility that doesn't fall, you know, completely neatly under a budget item or an audit item. Um, so in uh, redefining or, or strengthening, I think, the terms of reference for the committee, it appeared to us that we should change the name to reflect the responsibilities uh, that uh, we were putting forward. Member Houston. And did staff provide um, feedback on that? I'm just wondering if they helped provide input to inform the decision or the request. Yes, yeah, staff provided a, a whole, uh, provided uh, the uh, updated terms of reference and uh, provided their feedback on the change of the name of the committee and were supportive of it. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chandra, did you have anything you wanted to add? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So it's moved by uh, member, sorry, I said uh, Bilsma and member Clark that it be approved. Both of those actions be approved. Recommendations. Any opposed? Sorry, Chair Johnson, if I may interrupt for a moment. I believe um, member Clark has left the proceedings, so you'll need a different second. Member. Oh, a little sneaky double, eh? Yeah. All right, so we have uh, actually, is uh, member Kuhn Peterson still here? Smith will second. All right, we'll throw you in there. Thank okay, you. so it's moved, moved by Chair Kaywell and seconded by, oh, sorry, moved by, let's do it this way. It's moved by Chair Kaywell and seconded by Chair um, Smith that the two items for recommendation by the Audit, Audit and Budget Committee be approved. Any opposed? Seeing none, that is approved. Now I would like to receive the minutes. 
of the Audit and Budget Committee, and that would also include uh, what Scott was um, speaking to earlier in the in the meeting. And it is moved by, now we'll do, Member uh, Bilsma and Member Cridlin, and any opposed? Seeing none, thank you. And we're going on to notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion right now anybody would like to throw it on the table before we end the meeting? Brenda, okay, it's Ken, very quickly, uh, item 9.1.3. Could I just provide a very brief update? Oh, sorry, I had scratched that out. Go ahead, that's why I came to you at the very beginning. Go ahead. Okay, so this is an information item uh, on the financial uh, report on Q1 of 2020. Uh, what I'd like to make the board aware of is what happened with the 2020 capital budget. Uh, you may recall in October of last year, the board approved the uh, capital budget for consultation with the funding municipalities. We just wanted to make you aware that uh, Niagara region uh, funded less than half of the capital budget approved by the board and discussions are ongoing with Hamilton right now regarding alternatives to finance their capital requirements. You may also recall that a year ago, this board approved returning about 1.1 million of approved capital levy to the region. So over the past two years, more than $2 million of capital projects approved by this board have not been funded by Niagara Region. There are two takeaways that I just want to leave the board with. Um, we're going to have a more detailed review of our capital program. And Director Gagnon has already uh, spoken to the work that she has underway, and uh, this will be coming uh, to the Finance Committee and to the Board later this year. The second is that management are already turning their attention to what is called a new budget process for 2021, one that will ensure that we don't end up with a misalignment between what this Board approves and what our municipal partners agree to fund. So we just wanted to make sure that the Board was fully aware of that. And the report uh, on the Q1 2020, uh, we are tracking to budget at the end of the first quarter of 2020. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no other comments. And uh, it to be received. We already did that. Notice is a motion. I don't see anything on the docket. Any new business? Not seeing any new business. Uh, we don't have a closed session today. So we just need a, a mover and a seconder for adjournment. So before we do that, I think Grant might want to just do one more roll call and see if anybody has come in since we started the meeting. Uh, Grant, I think we did that last time and I think that cleared that, that cleaned some things up. So do you wanna do the roll call once again? And Grant's talking without muting, right? No, sorry. I, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I had some difficulty working the buttons. <laughs> no worries. Go ahead. Uh, Member Beattie? Yes, yeah, okay. okay. Still here. Actually, Member Brady? You know what? Why don't we just do the ones we missed at the beginning? And I think that was Member Brady and Member Shurton were the two that we weren't sure were, were going to be coming. All I right, know everybody you. else. We already did the roll call. Everybody else has already said yes. All right. Member Brady, are you there? Of course, uh, and then do we have member Shurton? Have you joined us? Nope. Or member okay. Steele? We have no new attendees. Okay, thank you. Maybe we'll put it that in there as the attendees roll call. We'll make it separate. Okay, so I see that member Hewson wanted to move a motion to um, to adjourn and I'm and I see it seconded by member Kaywell. All those in favor. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody. Really appreciate it. Another good meeting. Thank you. Everyone, have a great day. Have a great day. Stay safe everyone. Madam Chair, can I